All right, we're on step six. <laughs> we're going to talk about, we're going to be training these areas uh, when we're training our team. First thing we do is training as a disciple. Next is growing together spiritually. We're going to be using Henry Blackaby's book, Experiencing God. So this is a workbook. I like it because not only are they able to talk about a fantastic book together, but I can see if they're doing their homework. Because we're in a group, and I usually meet in a house. I love to be overcrowded. Amen. I want, I love to take them into my living room, and I'm not rich. I don't have a giant house. And I love 50 people packed in a living room that normally would seat five or six. <laughs> I love it, Amen. where they're like, you know, sitting on the sides of chairs, and they're just on the floor. It, is, it gives such a sense of movement when you have that packed of a room. Amen. And if your team gets too big for your house or wherever you decide to do it, you know, a, a core team member's house, um, then do it two days a week if you can afford to do that. You know, I know you've got busy schedules. But, uh, and then split the group in two. I've never had to do that, but you, you could get to that point. Um, so, anyway, we've got the team, we're training them, we're going through the workbook. I can see if they've done their homework. If they haven't done their homework, I'm taking note. And I usually have somebody else in the group who's on the other side of me. So I'll be on this side of the room. I have kind of a, a helper on the other side who's kind of looking at those books. And they're making note. If somebody doesn't do their homework, I'm just going to call, not accusatory. I want to see how their week's been going. Because maybe something bad's happened. You know, things happen to people, and they don't even tell you. Parents die, or, you know, horrible things happen, <clears throat> and they don't even let you know. So I want to make sure I'm in touch with them. But if they're just sloughing off, I'm going to make sure to reinvigorate them. Or if they get to the point where they just can't handle anymore, we'll move them to the different level, and I'll talk about that different level in another step. Um, but anyway, so these are the people that are committed to this church happening. And so... We also talked about leadership training. This, to me, is vital. We do not do this, we do not do this in church near enough. Um, we train people how to do ministry, but we don't train people how to lead people. And this is really important. And I'm not talking about leading people in ministry. I'm talking about how do you actually lead? How are you a leader? And so... Um, what we do is I spend a good amount of time. Now, this is more natural for me because I have a background in leadership. But if you don't know this, there are so many good books you can use that will help you train your team. Any one of these things, you can find resources that help you train a team in these areas. You know, um, I think I have time. Yeah, I've got time. When I, was, when I became an Adventist, um, I was a teenager, and none of my family, I mean, they all got baptized with me, but they didn't really want to stick with the church. My dad dropped out the day after he was baptized. Um, he said he just wanted to be baptized. He didn't want to be baptized in Adventist. Um, and then my mom and brother dropped out. So I was going to church on my bicycle. It was 10 miles each way, you know, 10 miles from my house, and this is in Colorado. I'd ride my bicycle in the rain, in the snow, to church and back. And I would average at least four times a week riding to that church. I mean, I was totally committed. Why? Because this church was totally committed to me. They were investing in their people. I was so blessed to have a church that trained how to lead. The very first thing they did was make me a leader in Pathfinder. Yeah, I was a junior, whatever they call them. I don't remember what it's called anymore. Um, <clears throat> but uh, a junior counselor or something. And, and I was leading things like how to, we, you know, they said, we want you to lead the uh, marching stuff. We're going to do a big camporee. I, don't, I, don't, I wasn't raised in Adventist, so this language is still a little foreign to me. Um, <clears throat> but... Uh, we're gonna, we want you to lead the marching in a camporee. 
And I just came up with wild, crazy stuff. I mapped it out on paper, and they're like, this isn't normal marching. And I was like, that's okay, let's try it anyway. We won first place for our marching. Because <laughs> it was just wild, crazy. And they just, they let me do it. You know, most churches are like, wait, that's not how we do things. You know? But they, they put me in charge, and they let me be in charge. They, they, they helped me teach youth Sabbath school. I had to teach. All of our youth had to rotate and learn how to teach. Um, they taught me how to, they made me a junior deacon. And that means that they gave me the keys. And when it was my week to open, it didn't matter if it was a foot of snow on the ground. I, they knew I'd be riding my bicycle through snow 10 miles to get to the church first so I could unlock the doors, turn on the heater so it's warm for everybody, and then make sure all the lights and everything are ready. And if it's my week to close, I'd have to shut everything down. They gave me the keys. They, they gave us great responsibility. And eventually they put me on the nominating committee. We were in choir together. We did a drama team where we toured prisons and other churches. Amen. There was so much stuff that we were doing all the time. Amen. Heavily invested, not just in youth, but in the other members as well. And that changed my life. Amen. I'm telling you, it changed my life. Amen. You see, my wife um, decided to go to Walla Walla for college. We were just engaged at the time. And I was too poor to go to school. Um, you know, there's a reason I rode my bicycle everywhere. I couldn't afford a car. Um, and so I tried to get into school, but they said, you don't make enough money. Your parents don't make enough money. Anyway, so I got a job at Pizza Hut part-time as a cook. And the very first day, they told me how to make, they showed me how to make pizzas. <clears throat> and then I remember the manager said, we have a meeting um, so make the pizzas. If it gets slow, clean up around the kitchen. So I make the pizzas, and it got slow, so I cleaned. They came out of the meeting, and they said, what happened here? And I was thinking I was in trouble. I was like, I'm sorry, did I do something wrong? And they said, no, we just have never seen the kitchen this clean before. You know, and I'm like, wow, that's, that's what you told me to do. <laughs> You know, um, my parents taught me to have a good work ethic. I had my first job at age 12, where I was earning a paycheck, not just a paper route. My first paper route was at age 9. Um, but I had a good work ethic, so I cleaned. So th in their mind, for some reason, cleaning kitchen well meant that I, should, I could be a good manager. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so they gave me, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever worked in restaurant work, the shift manager role. It's like the lowest of low managers you can be. But they made me a shift manager. And they took me into a training. Um, it was a Pizza Hut training for all the area churches in the region. Um, and we all got together for three days of intensive training of how to be a shift manager. And so they had a lot of good training going on. But they also started looking at us as leaders and they picked the five most outstanding leaders by the second day that they saw. And I was one of them, fortunately. And so now I had a team that I was running, about a team of 10. And so a part of that, you know, I was running my team and we were doing certain projects. And part of it is the team leaders had to give a speech. And it was a powerful topic. Amazing. I mean, it was, oh. Why is it important to make pizza? Such a powerful topic, right? <laughs> but I, I'm not joking with you when I tell you this. There were people crying when I gave my speech. Because I began talking about, I thought, this is such a boring topic. I, so I started thinking about it outside the box. And I start, so I talked about how families are so broken apart in today's world. The parents, the dad's working hard, sometimes two jobs. The mom is working. Kids come home to empty houses. Everybody's so disconnected. They're doing homework. And they come into your restaurant with the hope that they can recapture some of that family joy again, some of that love that they have for one another. And when they sit down at your table, you are helping them reconnect 
as a family. You're not just serving them a pizza. You're serving them joy and life and hope. And people were like, right. And, and at the end, they had... At the end, they had an award for the most inspirational leader, and I won that. And they gave, they, they, my wife, who was my fiance at the time, came to pick me up. It was in a different city where the training was. And the owner <clears throat> came up to her and said, who is this guy? Because I was 22 at the time, maybe 21 in that range. And, uh, and she goes, what do you mean? He's, she's, he's like, how does a guy this age know how to lead like this? And this is the reason for the story. She said, his church taught him. Amen. That, it, it really makes a difference. Amen. When we invest in our people, then they invest in the world and have a much greater impact in the world. It changes lives. They quickly made me a manager, and our store became the fastest growing store in the nation my first year as a as manager. Won some big award, I don't remember, I didn't care at that time, I was so young I didn't care. I was just having fun. And, and I, I just did things outside the box, like, like I was taught in church and like my parents taught me. You know, the first thing I did is I went to the sporting goods, or the sports arenas, and they were serving horrible food, and I said, what if I start bringing pizza to you? And every event you could sell pizza, You'd make as much profit as you're making now, and you'd have much better food. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we like that. So we were rushing pizzas to sporting events. Then I went to the schools, and I said, the pizza that you serve these kids is horrible. It's just this cheese, plain stuff. What if we started bringing you different kinds of pizzas? It's not going to cost you much more because you're going to save labor. So the, And I showed them the cost analysis on it. And pretty soon, the high schools and the junior highs, we were serving them every day bringing pizza for their lunches. And so our sales just skyrocketed. And so then they made me the manager, the highest level manager you could be in, in, that, in that franchise. It was a franchise, except for the owners. And so then I was running all the regions. And my primary job, you know what my primary job was? I was a restaurant planter. <laughs> Seriously. I would go into areas, learn about a community, decide where we needed to best put a location. I would train a team before we ever opened. Mm -hmm. So make sure that when we had our grand opening, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Everything was running well. God knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Amen. He put me in the right church Amen. that taught me how to lead. Then he put me in, in a pizza place that taught me how to plant. And then he brought me back into a church. That, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. So train your people how to lead. It's so important. Also, you've learned about the community. So start talking and training about how to impact this community. What are we going to do for this community? Very important. We also train about running the vital ministries. Now, this is, this is also very important. I train everybody in my core team how to run all the ministries that are vital to a church. Amen. Not just the greeter is going to learn about greeting, the children's ministry is going to learn about children's ministry. No. I train them all how to run them all. Why do I do that? Because I anticipate that when I leave to plant another church, some of them are going to be running this one, and others we're going to be sending out to plant new churches as Amen. well. It's always with multiplication in mind, and I tell them that. And this is exactly, actually, I learned this from Pizza Hut, too. One of the reasons I got promoted so quickly in Pizza Hut is because when I first started as a manager, they told me, your, your most important job is to replace yourself. That's right. and, they, and they said, you need to train people to do what you do. I took them dead serious. I didn't know that they were speaking you know, just sounding, you know, sound bites. I, I took it seriously. So every one of my dishwashers knew how to make pizza, answer the phone, make, write a schedule, <clears throat> wait tables, you know, run the cash register. My cash register people knew how to do all those things, including dishwashing. Everybody knew how to do everything. And I was training so many leaders 
that they began taking all of my leaders and making them managers of all the other restaurants around. So almost half of the restaurants around were run by people I had trained. And so that with our sales increase is why they said, man, we're going to make you the top level manager for the, for the region. Um, and so these things are, are really important, not just in business, but really important in the church. Amen. We need to be multipliers. And that's why we also do this. While I'm planting, I'm explaining like I am to you, but even in greater detail to them, why are we doing this step now? How does this relate to church planting? What are we going to be doing next, and why are we going to be doing that? I want them to be expert church planters by the time we launch this church. It's something that's vital. When we get to step 10, you'll understand more about that as well. So these are the things that I'm training on every single week. Now, a, a typical meeting will look like this. Let's say we choose Tuesday nights. Um, we will get together um, and have maybe at 6.30 or whatever time works best in that region, and we'll have a potluck dinner together. And we teach people how to make something if they keep bringing junk. Um, you know, if they keep bringing chips or something. Um, we just ask them, you know, is it tough to cook ahead of time? You know, what's going on? Because we want to have a nice meal. And, and people are like, well, it's so hard to do this. I'm like, if you go home tonight and make a meal, you're going to have to make your, your salad and your sides and your main dish. You're going to have to do all that. We're just asking you to be one thing. And we'll teach you how to make something that tastes good and you can make in 10 minutes, you know, if they don't know how to cook. You know, how to you make a salad fast, you know, it's easy. You know, bring a good side dish, something. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, everybody brings something for the meal. We eat in 30 minutes. Then we spend an hour and a half going through this, this stuff. So it's a two-hour meeting. It's a big commitment. Not everybody can make that commitment. So when I said I had 77 in my core team the first time I tried this, we went through way over 200 people to get that. So it's about a third of the people that I interviewed ended up on the core team. And these are people that are already pre-screened. Remember, I ask, who do you know that you think would be excited about this? That's really important. Not just who do you know. Who do you know that would be excited about this? That'll save you a lot of time. Because then they're giving you good, usually good prospects, good names that you can work with. Um, very important. <clears throat> so um, I go through this process, and it takes me usually six to eight months to get people where I'm looking for them to be. Um, and that, again, is two hours, or really an hour and a half of training a week. We also do special that we'll have like an all-day Sunday once in a while. We'll do, um, instead of a training once in a while, we'll do an impact event in the community so they can see the different kinds of, of ways that we're training in, in our in impact in the community as well. All right, does that make sense? Oops, this just turned yes. off. Oh, by the way, Boyan says hi, everybody. Boyan. <laughs> sorry I stole him. Not, I'm not sorry at all, actually. <laughs> all right, so let's see if I can get this to work here. Not working on my phone. All right. Any questions on that step? Yes. Training, training your leaders to run all ministry wouldn't that cause potentially burnout? And how do you how do you prevent burnout? I'm not having them do all the ministries. I'm just training them how to do. They're not going to be involved. Not everybody's going to be running everything. I'm just training them how to run them. So they may never, ever be a greeter, but I'm going to train them how to run greedy. The reason is is because eventually if they run a church, they're going to need to be able to train greeters. If they run a church, they're going to be needing to train and understand how worship works and how all of these things integrate together. So it's just training. It's not everybody will have their own ministries. It doesn't mean they're all involved in those things. Do you use any specific materials for the training? <clears throat> I create my own. You create your own. Yeah. Actually, you have handouts for my greeting ministry as an example of what we create. So, yeah. I don't, I don't like what other people do, honestly. I think it's subpar. And so when we, create, when we create training booklets, they are very specific 
and I, I think they're better than most people create. So you see these job descriptions, it's very vague. I want them to know exactly what they're being, gonna be doing, so yeah. How do you manage the shifting dynamic as new people enter the core team partway <coughs> Good question. through the training? The reason we start this, we don't, we, don't, um, we don't start the training until we hit about 10 to 12 people, that's when I start the training. But it doesn't take me long to get to my goal. Usually I'll be done in a month because I'm doing tons of interviews and I'm training other key leaders I think are good to do interviews too. Gotcha. So I'm not doing it all. And so within a month I'm at my, my level what I'm looking for. It's not that I won't still interview people. I might do a few more if they're really good. Um, but uh, <laughs> and then if those that come in later, I will do a, um, a training for them individually, just to catch them up. Okay. Yeah, so it's not, it's not too difficult though. But I don't usually try and throw somebody in a core team meeting, you know, four months after we start okay. training. Okay, that's yeah, that helps yeah. answer. Because they might, they it's might really mess that up first, the, that first month. They might mess up the culture. You got to remind that one thing. You got to remind your core team all the time. The core team ends at launch day. There is no such thing as a core team after we launch. Mm, okay. Because some of these people think that they are core after the church starts. Insiders, secret club. Yeah, it's not. Illuminati. You are just helping us build the culture. <laughs> yeah. As you move forward, do you typically use them as your board members, though? Or not always, or some of them, or none of it ever? I mean, how Usually is that? my board comes from that. But I... It's I don't want to guarantee. freak you guys out. We don't, we don't have a board. Well, whatever you call it, right, people right. that are kind of... Yeah, we have a ministries leadership team. Yeah. Sure, whatever you call it. Yeah. But you, you make it clear that it's not a guarantee after yeah. this. And, okay. and I tell people how boring it is to be on that team. <laughs> that, and seriously, we, are, we, we invert the pyramid for reals, not pretend. So my job, I tell them always, my job is to make you a success. And those who are on ministry leadership teams, their job isn't to be in the spotlight. Their job is to make other people successful. And so if you're, if you're being in, in the spotlight, then you're in the wrong role. So, and we only meet like seven times a year for about 45 minutes. It's very, you don't need it. Because our ministries are the ones that run the show. We'll talk about that a little bit in the next, yeah, yeah. What, what do you call the... Not board meeting, but what is it called? A ministry leadership team. Ministry leadership. Yeah. So key ministry, I don't want to get, I don't have time to go into. We design our church in a fractal system where every key ministry is broken down into its key components. And we have leaders trained in each one of those components. The person who is over that team is on the ministry leadership team. And so it's a very small group. We usually have six or seven people total. I don't understand how boards can run with 20 people. It doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> yeah, it just makes no sense. Yeah, yes and then yes. Jumping back to that question about people trickling in as the core team trainings are taking place, do you kind of water down those first few sessions to make them, no. you, you start with everything you've got and then you do side sessions yeah. individually? But again, you only have an hour and a half, so and that's a lot of stuff to cover, I mean, six, six I know. areas. So you're yeah. only spending you know, 10 to 15 minutes on an area. Okay, are you doing all six in every meeting? Yeah, all, every meeting I do all six. Okay. Unless I'm doing like a impact project instead or something. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and then I, cool. where's the other, there's another one over, over here. Over right here, right here. Right here. Right. Well, I know that you start you know, with this uh, kind of training uh, consistently. And where in the training you introduce, you know, um, Bible study and stuff like that so that people... That's a side thing. If they're not an Adventist, they'll usually come to me. I don't even talk to them about it. Honestly, this, this is my philosophy, and I know that people find this hard to believe. I don't think about that at all. It doesn't cross my mind because I know that the Holy Spirit is going to work in their life, and they're going to ask me. That happens all the time. It, and I have people... I have people in my core team... I assume they're all Adventists, unless I know they're not. I just assume they are. And I've been shocked. When we have our first evangelistic series three months after we open, 
I am shocked at some of the people who say, I want to be baptized. I, I think, I thought you were an Adventist. I had no idea. Um, <clears throat> so I don't think the same way. I and mean, That may be wrong or right. I just don't think in those terms. Um, if they want, if I think of them as, you know, critical pieces of my, our, our team and part of God's body. They're planting an Adventist church. They know it. And if they're not Adventist, they will be. Eventually, they will come to us. It's the same thing. When you're working with people who are far from Christ, all you have to do is just be their friend. Build a relationship. Don't press Bible studies. Because the Holy Spirit will, will do something in their life to make them come ask you. It happens all the time. You want to grab a mic? Yeah. Do, you have, um, do you have elders or, or people who, who execute that function? And what do you call them? We call them ministry team leaders. Okay. Same people. Yeah. And then do you have evangelism series or evangelistic yes. series? At least once a year, maybe twice. How do you do those? Um, I don't have time to go into that. That's, I have a full cycle. I'll give you a very brief rundown. We have eight different kinds of evangelism that we do three times a year. So we have a cycle. Every two weeks, we're doing another type of evangelism. And so that cycles through. It's a 16-week cycle. It cycles through into a reaping meeting. Cycles through into a reaping meeting. But sometimes, at the end, we don't do a reaping meeting. We do some other kind of meeting. Um, but anyway, it's, it's so complex. I have an exact a whole day training on just that. Um, but we do do reaping meetings. I am very pro traditional evangelism if you do it right. If you do it wrong, it's useless. And the reason why so many people don't do evangelism today is because they're doing it wrong. They're thinking that it, a meeting is the answer. The meeting isn't the answer. It's the end of a long process. It's actually the middle of a long process. And if you don't do the beginning process, the meeting itself is just, it's worthless. Well, I shouldn't say worthless, but it's fairly, fairly worthless. Um, and it's tough, yeah. All right, so let's get into your groups. You will see that you have a full list of stuff here. So you have nine minutes to answer all of those questions. So you need to hurry. It's called step six. Okay. I don't know why it's working like that. Okay. Okay. Now number six. Um, so you're 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 going to be talking about how this would help your church if you did it, and how it doesn't help if you don't do it. What will happen if you don't do it? So number six, teach them how to plant future churches. How is that beneficial, and how, or how it would hurt if you didn't do it? Number six, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what we talked about was that um, what you mentioned about churches being born pregnant. Yes. That they know that the end goal is not the establishment of that church, but rather the the establishment of that church as a sending out capacity. And nice. the opposite of that would be um, starting the church with the end goal of saying we want to be the the biggest, the mega church, the the best, the the one with the most resources. It's uh, it's going to be a dead end. Nice. Very good. Very good answer. Excellent. All right. Number five. Tell us how training uh, to best impact your, your community helps, and if you don't, how does it hurt? Uh, the community yeah. impact. Uh, so it becomes uh, mission-oriented. Yeah. Very good. And if we don't do it, we generate a consumer church. Excellent answers. Excellent. Boy, these are some good oh, answers. Wow. Hey, Steve, All right. by the way, oftentimes, it's just for everybody to know, oftentimes we're talking here not because we're... Yeah, because we're, just we're you're you're translating. We're yeah. translating. I totally understand. So, yeah. thank you for your yeah. for y'all's yeah. understanding. I noticed you said oftentimes, not always. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number four for this group. Uh, training core team to be proficient in running vital ministries. How is that helpful if you do it? And what could be the damage if you don't? Apocalyptica. 
Well, uh, uh, like you said, you have more people that can do you know, the, the same job, and even if you don't have uh, that specific leader, you can always use another one. And those same leaders can become also, um, you know, reproduce themselves. Yeah. So Good. I think that's, that's very important. And what about, what if you don't do it? What would be a negative side effect? Well, that, it's kind of the, of course, the opposite. You don't have, you know, a, a specific leader that you train, it leaves, and then you have a, you have a gap there. Mm, good point. And, and yeah. then, you know, it creates some disorder there. Yeah, very mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you train people how to run these ministries, like he was saying, you never know if a leader's going to move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, you have other people who can step in and fill the gap until another leader is trained. And also when you plant another church, you have people who are going to be leaving, but you'll have people staying behind that know how to run these things as well. How All right. About, how yeah. about when the pastor moves? Yeah, pastor moves too. That's one, one of the leaders. But honestly, by the time I get to year two in a church plant, I'm useless. All I've, I've trained everybody, and so there's very little I need to do anymore. I'm preaching about twice a month because I've trained so many people to preach that I need them in the rotation so that they stay strong in preaching. You want to be, in a year and a half, two years, obsolete, obsolete so you can go plant another church. Yes, you don't want to stay there forever. That's not the model we were given. Now, if you want to stay there forever, that's fine. Just train people and send them out to plant churches. Yeah. But always be multiplying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Deep. Coming again to the situation that the move of the pastor. Yeah. But the pastor that replaced you has a complete different philosophy. So this is this is this is legacy talk here now. Like what do you do if you're gonna move? The conference will just move you without you asking sometimes. Um, or you'll get a call and you'll take it, whatever happens. Um, you need to prepare your church for that up in up front. So we talk about that up front. How do we be a lay-driven church if a new pastor comes in and says, I don't believe in this model? What do we do? How are we going to handle it? You go through that. Every church is going to handle it differently. Mm -hmm. You go through it. Some people are just going to say, when the pastor comes in, we're going to tell them, go to your other churches. Don't bother us. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that that's a good thing. But that's, <laughs> that's what they might say. Other churches will say, we will... We will you know, so what I've done is I try and work with the conference to understand the type of leaders that they need to bring in after. You know, because when my first couple of church plants and I left, they brought in horrible people. And it killed two of my church plants. Mm. Yeah. So you give, you give training to the conference leaders? Yes. <laughs> well, you, you give suggestions. Yeah. All right, number three, building a loving spiritual community. So the reason why we, we, we tied this one with number, with number five, um, loving community with impacting your community. Um, no, we're talking about, when we're saying loving spiritual community, we're talking about the body, how it reacts with itself. Oh, okay. So oh, we, we probably took it about in a different way. But, yeah. but maybe as a body, um, we, we want to make sure that it's, it's a community where um, we embrace, we accept. Um, it's a no judgment zone okay. type, of, type of thing. And I think that will allow us to, if we can internally do that, we'll be able to do that with other people All right. that are not like us. Let, let's, uh, just for the sake of time, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, go over these next two. Um, so building a loving spiritual community, that's, that's true. And we're going to explain this a little bit more in step eight, how that, that is done and more, because that's a very important step. Of course, training people to be effective leaders, I explained that quite extensively. And then building them as, as uh, disciples, we talked about already. So let's continue. If I can get my phone to work on here again. There it is. All right, so we're going to be doing, look at number seven here. And let me set my timer so I don't get caught up in telling stories. All right, so this is build your impact ministries. This is my newest step. Oh, by the way, is somebody trying to airdrop me something? Anybody here? Yeah, I just let me just. Yeah. 
Let me just take that off so it's not here the whole time. All right. All right. So um, this is the latest step that I added in my 10 steps. Um, Anthony Wagner Smith at Natty, uh, when I was sharing with him many years ago, my process, he said, you're missing a step, and it made perfect sense. Um, so build your impact ministry. These are, you're actually going to be planting ministries before you plant the church, yes. before you actually have the worship service. You're going to start um, developing uh, ministries in your community that will impact the community. So you know the needs of the community. You know what type of ministries you should by this time know what type of ministries will be effective at helping the community and also serving your church. So I can't tell you what those, those are. Those ministries are different for every church. Now, there's some that are common for every church as well. So we're going to go through the common ones, and there'll be others that you would, you would have as well. So, but you want to make sure that they're running well before your grand opening. Let's go back to Pizza Hut when I was Pizza Hut planting. When I started Pizza Huts, do you think on the opening day I hired a team and then we're having our grand opening. That morning I gather my team and I say, all right, uh, why don't you be a cook? Why don't you answer phones? Why don't you be a deliver driver? Why, why don't you uh, run the register? You know, would that make sense to just, just throw jobs out? I mean, how effective would that be? It'd be horrible. And so when I was running those restaurants, we created what we call star teams. And I would highly, highly train several individuals. We bring in five individuals from around the region that I had trained that they were the best trainers in each of these areas. And when I opened a new restaurant, we would hire a staff, and then myself and the star team would train the staff and I mean, we trained them. And everybody went through every team member's training. So again, if you're going to be a driver, you're going to learn how to cook. You're going to learn how to wash dishes. You're going to learn how to do everything. So we, we want people to be proficient. And really, the next step is we hand you the manager label. Um, we want people to know what they're doing. And when we do that, then when we have the grand opening, there's not all these flaws that you see a lot of businesses and churches have. Um, so we're doing the same thing. We want to make sure that our ministries are running well before we open. So one of the ministries is worship. Worship is one of the biggest failures in the Adventist church. Um, if you look at, and this isn't just my saying this, there is lots of data about this. Many churches have taken um, the assessment tests that we have and worship and small groups are the failures big time <laughs> in, in Adventist churches. And this is not by pastor standards. This is what the members are saying. They're saying that worship is not engaging. Um, we need to make sure that worship is engaging. And it doesn't matter if it's contemporary, blended, uh, more traditional. It needs to be done right. Yeah. It needs to be done well. Mm -hmm. uh, you have somebody walking into your church, especially now in these days, where they have no background in, in religion. They're walking into a place that they're singing together, and they've never seen it before. Where do you go to sing together? <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing it horribly, they're going to be like, what is with these people? When you have people that don't know how to play the instruments correctly, when you have people who are singing off key, when you have worship teams, I see this all the time, these contemporary teams that don't know how to make the slides go forward, that don't know how, that are singing off key, that get lost, they don't know this is the part when we come in. It really, it's better not to do music <laughs> if you're going to do music like that, honestly. Because I don't think it honors God. I do not think that kind of music honors God. And, and maybe I'm being too hard on it, but honestly, I would rather see no music than poorly done. Because it just tells God. And I know that people in the congregation can be worshiping even if it's poor music. 
but again, we're not here just for them. We're here for those people who don't know Jesus. And if it looks really poor, let me give you an example. Let's go back to the restaurant idea. Let's say that your friend tells you, hey, we should go, you should go check out this restaurant. They have great food. And so you walk into the restaurant, you're all excited because your friend said that it has great food. You walk in and you say, I'm going to go to the bathroom before I get seated. You walk into the bathroom and there's a bug crawling across the counter. There's paper towels on the floor. It smells horrible, and it's filthy. What are you going to do? You're going to leave. You don't want to eat at a place. The food might be great. The kitchen might be clean. But that created a major roadblock for you right away because you saw something done so poorly in that business. They didn't take care of the bathroom. And, and so that's the same type of thing. We create roadblocks in our churches when we don't do our ministries correctly. And so worship is one of those that we have not done well in the Adventist church. We take it for granted that people are worshiping. And it is becoming much more of just a habit, a tradition, than actual worship. This is the question that I... I resonate so much with when it, the question is asked, do you meet God in church? Do you meet God in church? I mean, if we are coming to worship God together, shouldn't God actually be there too? Shouldn't people actually have an encounter with God, however they encounter God themselves? And it could be an, in silent prayer. It doesn't have to be in worship. But we have to do things that are done in a way that there's actually an opportunity for Adventists to worship. Because when Adventists are worshiping, those who don't know God, they get excited. People who don't know God love to see people actually worshiping. Yeah. It really is a statement to them that there is something real and vibrant happening in their relationship with God. When we are singing songs, contemporary or hymns, whatever it is, and they are, it's just tradition, and it doesn't make sense, man, it just, it's so sad. It's so sad. Again, it'd be better just to get up and start preaching day, second one than to start doing that stuff, unless your preaching's horrible. <laughs> so, it better not be. Yeah, it better not be. Don't punt on preaching. There's three things you have to do right. You have to do right. You have to do worship right, you have to do preaching right, you have to do greeting right. If it's a family-oriented church, you have to add the fourth thing, children's ministries. You have to do those things right. So we train on what does it look like to have a true, vibrant ministry in the church in worship. And I'm not talking about just singing. The whole process of, of how we are presenting God to the members and the visitors. Greeting. I gave you kind of example sheets in your packets of what we do. Just to kind of give you, this isn't even everything, but I just thought it would be nice for you to see. Um, it's So when we do ministries, every ministry has to be evangelistic. We don't do any ministry unless it's evangelistic. And so how do you make greeting evangelistic? Is it evangelistic to say, welcome, here is, or happy Sabbath, here is your bulletin. <laughs> that's, that's nice, it's nice and warm and friendly, so maybe there's a little touch of it. But we actually take ministries to the next level. And we ask, so our greeters, we tell them this, your job as a greeting team is that everyone who walks in this church within 10 minutes, we'll never want to go somewhere else. All right. Now, we can't say that everybody will respond that way, but that's your job. That's what you are called to do. Now, how do you do that by saying, Happy Sabbath, here's your bulletin? It's not possible. 
That's unless you're saying happy Sabbath, here's your bulletin and a million dollar check, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's not how we do it. So we said, so what do we do to make greeting evangelistic? So much so that people will never want to go somewhere else. They feel like this is home right away. And so we develop a three-tier system of greeting. I'm going to give you a very quick overview of what it looks like. Outside greeters. We have people that are outside that don't look at all like they are greeters. They're just usually a couple of guys that are standing outside chatting to each other. And when they see somebody come in, they might smile and nod, but they're not rushing over and scaring people. Um, but they're looking for signs of discomfort. So a new person, like when I got to this conference office, I couldn't figure out exactly how to get in. You know, where is, this, where is the entrance? Adventist <laughs> churches are notorious for hiding are their so entrances. Bad. Top secret. Oh, it's, it's horrible. And so how do I know where to go? So I parked in the back and had to wander around until I found the door um, that was the entrance. Now, it, this is actually marked better than others. There's just no parking up there. So, so anyway, that's what happens at churches. Like, we'll have churches where people go, everybody goes in this side door. And you have this front door, but nobody goes in it. It's just really odd. Um, so we want people in the parking lot that look, if anybody's looking like they're confused, Hey, are you looking for the entrance? Hey, can I help you? Very simple, real easy. If it's raining or snowing, which you guys don't have much snow, but if it's raining or snowing, um, they are always carrying two umbrellas. If they see somebody get out of a car without an umbrella, they're going to, hey, let me help you with that, and just walk them in so that they're not getting wet. Um, if they see somebody struggling to carry stuff, you know, maybe a, a mom is you know, got three kids and a stroller and a bag. Hey, can I help you with that stuff? Um, if they're having parking issues, then they switch. They put on a vest and it says parking assistant. And people can just pull up and they'll park their car for them. You know, for the people who are elderly or handicapped, they'll do that for them as well. We, whatever it takes to make that very first experience not scary. Do you know that you'll have people come into your parking lot who are thinking about going to church and they will just sit there? That's true. Yep. They will try and decide if they're going to go in. Wow. If you have some friendly faces outside, it makes them much more at ease. Don't run up to the cars, though. That scares people. <laughs> they don't know what you're trying to do. All right? So second level, once they enter the building, that becomes much more like a more seems like a traditional greeter but instead of saying happy sabbath they say welcome thanks for being here why do we do that you all know right adventist jargon makes people feel like outsiders if they're not adventists so we just don't use the term i mean not that we don't want people to have happy sabbaths <laughs> but we don't use that term when we're greeting people we want, we want everybody to feel inclusive. Same thing when we're preaching, when we're doing worship leading. We use language that makes sense. I don't say, you know, the spirit of prophecy tells us. That just makes no sense to people outside of the Adventist church. You know, the, the inspired pen. <laughs> it's just like, what? Yeah. Even Sister White says... And they're like, Sister White? He's got a sister named White? Or, or is she in this congregation? I mean, it's such a strange thing. So, you know, when I was, a, um, when I was around 9 or 10, I guess, my dad was raised a Catholic, and he started going back to Mass once in a while, and he took me to one. And it was so uncomfortable because everybody knew when to get up and kneel, and get up and recite some prayer, and then they sang a song, and it was, there was definitely, everybody knew what was happening but me. And I was totally confused. I kept looking at them like, how do they know what's going on? I was looking for, like, is it in a program? Is it not? Nowhere. It didn't show anywhere that you're supposed to do this stuff. And yet we go into our Adventist churches, and they're doing the same types of things. 
You know, you'll have a prayer and then everybody starts singing a song together. <laughs> and people are like strange visitors, like, where is the words to this song? How did they know to start? It makes no sense unless you're an insider. Then it makes perfect sense. For us, you're like, oh, yeah, that's what Adventists do. That's what good Adventists do. No, that's not actually what good Adventists do. That's what consumerist Adventists do. Mission-minded Adventists make sure that they're doing everything possible to make people feel comfortable. Yes. You can still sing those songs, but put them on the screen. Yep. You know, make it, make it easier for people who are coming in the first time. Yep. Put an order of service that's clear if you're going to hand out a, a, we call them programs because it makes more sense to people than bulletin. Um, but when you have your bulletin, have an order of service so people can follow along and they can understand what's going to be happening next. If you're going to sing a certain song, say, we're going to sing a song. Don't use terminology they'll never understand. We never use the word doxology. <laughs> if you're not a Christian, that doesn't make any sense. We call it the actual words that they are, you know, in, in English language of today. We don't use language that makes no sense to people. So just be cognizant of that. So they're greeting people. They welcome them in. Then they, then they, if they see somebody they don't know, they always ask something like, hey, listen, so great to have you today. By the way, I am, I am just horrible remembering names. Have we met before? And instead of saying, are you new? And then the person will say, usually, no, this is my first time. Oh, this is great. So glad to have you here. Hey, you know what? I've got a special gift to say thank you for joining us today. Let me get somebody to help you, though. And then they'll turn around. Let's say this person's name was Marco. Um, I would say, hey, Paul, come here. I want to introduce you to Marco. This, Marco is joining us for the first time today. Paul's like, oh, that's great. Hey, Paul, would you go give him one of our special gifts for first-time um, guests? Oh, sure. And so Paul now is a third-level greeter. He's been standing back there with the other third-level greeters. They don't look like greeters. They look like people just talking. And we want, that, we want people who are happy and fun, not grumpy, um, to be greeters. We also want to have a diversity of people that reflect the diversity of our community. I get really tired of going into communities uh, or to churches where all the greeters look exactly the same or exact same age and they don't represent the community at all. It just doesn't make sense to me. So anyway, Paul then, his job is to evaluate and we teach IQ or, or I'm sorry, EQ uh, to our greeters, so he, he can read body language, um, and he knows how Marco is responding to his, because some people are very introverted, they don't want somebody helping them, um, so he will do a very quick job with a strong introvert or somebody who's uncomfortable, but typically what it looks like is he's giving them a gift, as soon as he gives the gift and, and the, it touches their hand, this is all planned out and practiced many times, as soon as that gift touches his hand, the hand, he would say, Marco, by the way, we want to be able to serve you even more than just today. Would you mind registering, um, uh, putting your, your information here? And you let them put what information they want. Yep. So we have an iPad, and they type in whatever they want. We ask for their name, their address, their phone number, and their email. Um, if they don't put their email... Um, that's usually the trickiest thing. We like the email if we can get that. And so we actually ask for that right after the name. Name, email, then phone number and address. That's the order we ask it. Um, but if they don't, they don't. That's okay. They don't have to put anything they don't want to. Then what Paul would say is, is hey, Marco, are you meeting anyone here today? No, I'm not. Well, you know, I'm going down right now. We have a, a, a class that's actually <laughs> discussing the Bible together. And I was going to go down there right now. Um, if you'd like, would you like to join me? Well, sure. And so Paul will take Marco down. As they're walking in, the teachers are, are know that when they see a third-level greeter, um, they are supposed to acknowledge them. And so even if they're in the middle of a conversation, they're going to stop and say, hey, Paul, how are you doing? Great. Hey, everybody, I want you to introduce you to, to Marco. And then just sit down and continue with the class. 
And so then after the class is done, it you know, depends on what time Marco shows up. After the class is done, Paul's going to say, listen, we're going to go upstairs and there's a service uh, that we're going to have, the church service. Um, if you don't have anybody to sit with you, I'd love to, to keep chatting. Can, you want to go up together? And you go up together. So Paul's job is to get to know Marco. And he's learning about his, maybe his work, and he's sharing about himself as well. Just simple things. Don't overwhelm them with questions, but simple things. Once you get to know them, then you can start introducing. So Paul will begin to introduce Marco. Let's say Marco is, is a nurse. He might introduce Marco to some other medical professionals. Maybe Marco likes to ride you know, bicycles you know, and does a lot of that type of exercise. He would try to introduce him to somebody else who does the same thing. Trying to build connections. Paul is now Marco's person. And every time Marco comes in, Paul is watching for Marco. And he just, there's, so there's a process that we use. Um, and we can't go into it because I'm running out of time. But anyway, so we create, we create um, visual representation of how things go. And then also we create the step-by-step -step guide of how things go for greeters. You can use anything like that. You can do your own stuff. But every ministry, their job is to do it to a very, very high level. So worship leaders, they know their job is to bring people to the throne of Christ. Your job is not singing. Your job is to bring people so that they can have an easier time understanding that God is right there for them ready to be connected with them. That is very important. We want our worship team to practice just like somebody writes a sermon. They know what they're going to be saying next. We plan our services. Now listen to this. This might freak you out. We plan our services out 60 days in advance. We plan our services out 60 days in advance. I know every single person who's going to be a greeter, who's going to be in the worship team, who's going to be doing prayer, everything, 60 days in advance. And we get commitments from people 60 days in advance so that they can be prepared for that service. When I talk about doing things with excellence, we're dead serious about it. We, we are dead serious. We use, um, you can use CCB if you're if your conference, do you guys use CCB here? No, okay, so obviously you would know if I knew what it was. Yeah. You use it yourself? Okay, yeah, very good software. But if your conference doesn't, it's very expensive. So you can use Planning Center Online, is which I use. PlanningCenterOnline.com. Very effective for all this stuff. All right, children's ministry. So just like greeters, what do we tell our children's ministry leaders? We tell them, your role is to make children's ministry so impactful on your kids that if their parents want to sleep in, they will drag them out of bed to go to church. And that's exactly, we've had that happen so many times where parents came up to us and said, you know, we, we had such a long week, we were going to sleep in. Our kids would not let us. They insisted on going to church. That's the kind of children's ministry we want to have. Where these kids are meeting Christ, and then they're having a great time doing it at the same time. That they really want to come back to that community. Small groups. In our church, we tell people up front that you must be part of a small group, period. You don't have a choice. You can't, please remember, we're planting a church. You can create whatever culture you want. You can create the right culture from day one. It's much more difficult to try and introduce this stuff into existing churches. Don't try unless you want to call somewhere else because they're going to boot you out. <laughs> if you try and implement all of this stuff into an existing church, you're going to have a very difficult time. But small groups, everyone has to be part of a small group community. You just have to be. And the same thing with service and ministry. We have 100% of our members in ministry. That's, it, it's non-negotiable. Why? 
because you're not going to grow as a disciple. I am stealing from you. I am, I am doing you a major disservice if I let you come and just watch as a member. Now, if you're a visitor, you can. I am, I am stealing from you if I don't help you become part of the community. I am dishonoring God as a leader by allowing you to be a consumer because you're not going to grow spiritually that way. So you have to be part of a ministry. You have to be part of a small group. Now, small groups, though, include our Sabbath schools. So if you just want to come Sabbath morning, you're so busy, then we make sure that our small groups are run, our Sabbath schools are run like small groups. Community outreach, everybody also is part of what's called an impact team, and I'll explain that um, real fast because I'm out, out of time. Impact teams, we, every single person is on a four-person impact team. So usually once or twice a year, your impact team is running an outreach program. It's not very often. It's, it's not, not often at all. But you're running, you're running the program. You're the logistical uh, people. That doesn't mean you're the only people that are going to be doing it. But your team is going to rotate through the calendar. And when your team comes up, you're running that. So you have plenty of time to prepare this outreach program with excellence. We want everything to be done very, very well. I wish I had time to go through our cycle of evangelism, but we don't have time for that. Uh, but everybody's part of community outreach as well. All right, questions? You'll have other, other ministries that you know, pertain to your particular communities as well. All right, no questions. Good, all right. Let's go then to our teams. If you look, you're at step seven on your sheet. Yeah. Okay, grab your little mic thing. So I don't know if you're going to cover these, but, uh, you know, of course, there are certain people that are more able to do certain kind of work in the, in the church. Right. How do you, I don't know if you already said that, but maybe not. No. How do you designate or how do you choose the people that Great are... Great question. Right. Um, so it used to be that from Advent Source you could get a thing called Connections. They've updated, I don't remember the name of the new program, but I use the old program because I think it's better. But basically it goes through what are, your, what are your spiritual gifts, what are your passions, and what is your experience. And so every person goes through that process in the training to learn what are their spiritual gifts, so what has God naturally gifted you at, but that doesn't mean you're, it matches. So like, if your spiritual gift is teaching, I might make you an adult Sabbath school leader. I might have really messed up. Because what if your, your passion is working with kids? So I want to learn both your gifts and your passions and then your experience. You know, Maybe you're a full-time teacher and you're passionate for kids and you have the gift of teaching. Well, that's a no-brainer. That's an easy one. Most of them are not that easy. So what we do is we help them then... We, we, have, we have a ministry placement team. Now, in church planting, you don't have it yet, so we'll teach on that as well in the process. But we work with people to learn what would they be best at. What are they, what are they made for? Is there so, a, re, a resource like that? Yeah, Advent Source. Advent Source. Advent Source has a resource on this that we use. Okay, just a, just a quick yeah. question. So you yeah. do that at the very beginning, or you, fir you first teach everyone to do everything, and then you... Yeah, everyone learns how to do everything. They don't do everything. That's right, a big right. difference. Mm -hmm. So we want them to work in their area of giftedness. Yeah, so what I'm saying is mm -hmm. you first teach them how to do everything, Yeah. and then, and then you assign according to their gifts. Right, right. and they get, to try, they get to try things out too. So once the church is going... Then you have a five-week trial period in a ministry. You do it for five weeks. You meet with the ministry assessment, the, the team leader for that ministry, and the assessment coach. Uh, and between the three of you, decide if that's a good fit for you. If it is, then you continue in that ministry. If it's not, you celebrate because you, you knock something off the list, and you go to something else. So, yeah. All right. Yes, sir. Can you grab the mic? Uh, 
cuando hablamos de grupos pequeños, ¿qué well, tipo de grupos pequeños son los que utilizaría en una iglesia recién plantada? We, when we talk about small groups, what kind of groups are we talking about when we're planting a small church? Y digo esto uh, porque uh, casi siempre plant. es el grupo pequeño de alcance evangelístico más que de otra cosa. Because often time, I say this because often times uh, when we talk about small groups, we're thinking about uh, evangelism groups and things like that. Yeah. So th there's a difference between what the Spanish often do in small groups and what I do. And actually, what I do is a lot different than most Adventist churches do. Um, we do, and I don't have time to train you in this because this is a full day training too. But the way we do small groups is called free market small groups. And free market small groups are the leaders are trained how to lead, but they can do anything they want. They can have recreational groups. They can have Bible study groups. They can study an Ellen White book. They can do a cooking class. They can do whatever they want. Anything, anything, knitting underwater if they wanted, if they think they can get people to come to it. So, yeah, it's. So, any, any small groups that has, I mean, that they, they, they come up with, but obviously with mission minded, right? No. Not really. The mission is to build relationships. Yeah. Uh, now, the leaders are trained how to be missionaries in the groups. Okay. So, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm going to run out of time. Semester system or no? Semester system only. We only do, we are small groups. Start at the same time, end at the same time. These are powerful. I wish I could train you on this. Our small group system, the first time I did this was in my third church plant. We had 140 people attending church. When we launched the system, we had 27 small groups. The first, they all started at the same time. We had 240 attending our groups. So there was 100, 100 more people in groups than in our church. And in six months, we grew that church from 140 to 277. Mm, mm. A lot of it was because of the small group connections. Wow. So you're building, it's an evangelistic, even if you're doing a hiking group, it's evangelistic. Because you are building friendships, and friendships are the fastest way to bring people into the church. All right, so let's get into our teams. You're in step seven. You only have seven minutes for this one, so do it quickly. We are now on step eight. This step is called the five-month pre-launch oh, process. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, this one is um, once your core team gets to the size that you want. So you've begun training them maybe when they're around 10, 12 people. You continue to grow your team. And once you get your team to the size that you want, they're, they're coming to the training, they're seeming to get it, and you, you think about five months in the future, the training will be done. Um, so you're going to create a calendar, or look at a calendar, and you're going to say, okay, so in five months from this date, we're going to have our grand opening service. Yeah. You continue training during this. Yeah, <laughs> you train through the entire process. So don't don't stop that. So let's say, whoops, not that one, this one. Let's say you're looking at this calendar and today is this day and you say in five months we'll be ready to launch. So you set your grand opening date. And then we'll have a process that you follow over those five months. It includes your weekly core team training meetings. That still happens. At about this time is when I tell my core team, when we get ready to start this five month pre-launch, this is when you drop all of your current ministries at whatever church you might be part of. Mm, yeah. If you have administered regular attenders in leading ministries, they need to be prepared to release those ministries by this time. Because now you're going to be asking them to do stuff twice a week. And people will come up with excuses. I'm too busy at church to do this too. So they have to know that they're going to be dropping those ministries at this time. They're going to be, their full-time ministry is starting this new church plant by this time. So that's what they're going to be doing. And so let me explain what this looks like. Um, so you've got this five months out. So let's say, let's say you're in September. And it's September 1st, and you're saying, okay, we're ready to plant this uh, in five months. The team has grown to 30, 40, 50, whatever I thought it should be. 
Uh, the training is going well. I, I can see that they're going to be ready in about five months. So I go September to October, November, December, January, somewhere around early February. I'm going to look at the calendar and I'm going to pick a date. Now, if it lands somewhere around Christmas, Thanksgiving, you're going to move it into January. If it lands right in the middle of the like, major holidays, even if it lands in the middle of the summer, it's not a good time usually to start a church. Depends on your area. Sometimes summer's not a big, 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 area, big deal because it's hot and people don't do anything anyway. It might be okay. But like in Seattle where you get you know, two months of summer a year, you would never dream of planting a church. You know, so I had a summer one time that lasted three weeks in Seattle. Um, so um, you would never want to plant in the summer because people are enjoying that, you know, that few, few months of nice weather. So do it strategically. But anyway, you pick a date. And let me get out of that. And then you're going to create a new team. Nobody's allowed to laugh at my drawing here. <laughs> no, I just said not to laugh. <laughs> Let me what you said. Tell you. All right, so you have your core team that you're training. They're meeting weekly in your training. You've developed them. Now we're going to create another team. We're going to create what we call the launch team. They will not be part of your weekly training. Um, they will be there to help you with this five-month process get ready to start a church and they'll be part of your congregation now you may have during the process you'll have somebody that says you know what my job just changed my kids are sick whatever it is i can't keep coming to training no problem you you, you show sympathy for them you minister to them if you can and then just tell them well, that's simple we'll move you into the launch team instead of the core team um, so it will ease your burdens um, and, and such. Um, you may also, when you're building this team, you may find somebody who's really good. And you may say, you may invite them to pray about being part of the core team as well. But you'll have to spend the time catching them up on the training. Um, so this is more difficult than this. Mm -hmm. But you can have some fluctuation. So everybody who's on the core team is actually part of the launch team. But not everybody who's part of the launch team is part of the core team. It's the same thing as saying everybody on the church board, don't say that this is the church board, though. Everybody on the church board is part of the church membership, but not every member is part of the church board, if you want to think of that way. Um, so we're going to be now developing a launch team a little bit different than how we develop the core team. And so you're going to have this five months, and you're going to be doing... Um, something different every week of the month. So you're going to have a monthly cycle that includes these four things. And so the first thing is five months out, so let's say September 1st, I'm going to have an information meeting. And what is an information meeting? It's the same thing as an interview that you do one-on-one, -on -one. I used this, the information sheet that we created with the proposal. Remember that? I gave you an example of it. Um, I use the same sheet, and now we have, instead of doing one-on-one -on -one interviews, now we have a public session where our core team is inviting everybody they know to this first one. And all we're doing is giving information about a new church that we're starting that's unlike any church they've ever seen. I use that terminology all the time because I want people to be curious. This is like nothing you've ever seen. Um, and it is. Every church is unique, so any church could really say that. Um, um, I would be curious. <laughs> and so we want people to come. And we're explaining how we're a church for the community, how we're going to build disciples. We go through all that process the same as we would do in an interview. And if you notice on the back of that handout that I gave you, um, it's called Understanding, let's see, it's an example, I don't know what it's called. Where is it at? Somewhere up here. I don't have a full thing. Oh, here it is. Example information sheet for a church plant. This back sheet 
is what we do in the interviews I just talked about. I don't hand them this sheet. But when we're actually doing this in the information meetings, this is printed on the back of the sheet as well. And this is what we want, that, how they, we want them to, uh, to reply. Give their name, email, and phone number. And will you pray about joining this group? Um, and sorry, this says core team. That really should say launch, launch team. team. Um, that, I just did that for your information because you could use this as you're doing interviews. Um, will you please um, add us to your daily prayer list? We explained that. And then we don't know enough people. Who do you know that would be excited about coming to our next information meeting? Um, and so they give us contact information of people they think would like to hear. And then they just turn this back. But does that mean they don't have the information to take with them? Yeah, they, they can. We actually give two separate sheets, yeah. But this is just to say paper we printed on one. <laughs> so this is something that we use. But there's a little bit different wording because this is more of a training tool. Uh, but basically, this is what we use when we're doing an information meeting. We let people ask questions. The whole meeting takes 45, 50 minutes. It's because we're not doing the back and forth. An interview takes usually an hour to an hour and a half. Um, but when we're not asking a lot of questions, then it doesn't take that long. So it's just kind of getting it out there, letting people know what's coming. And those people who join then are becoming part of the launch team. And we explain, those that join, we're going to be doing a weekly meeting. And we want you to help us with the logistics of those um, as much as you can. And so at the end of the meeting, we give everybody 10 really nicely made invitation cards. And we say this, we, we are going to do a social next week. We're not going to pretend it's a church service and, and it, hide it inside a social. It's just going to be fun. And so we want you to invite everybody you know. It doesn't matter if they're religious or not. Um, and we give everybody these invitation cards. We're going to meet next week. We're going to be at this park or this house or this venue or whatever we're going to be doing. And we're going to meet at this time. We're going to have food. We're going to have fun. It'll, the information will be on that information or on the invitation card. And then as you're going out, you'll see a table with more invitation cards. If you need more than 10, feel free to grab some more. And we, so we invite everybody to invite everybody they know. So now you've had this first information meeting, and then you have people you never met now inviting people to a social. So you'll have more people you never met coming to a social. At the social, just have fun. But don't play organized sports that are dangerous or hyper competitive. That's not a good way to build no. friendships. Um, <laughs> um, also, don't just sit there and watch a movie because you're not having interaction. <laughs> but you want to do stuff where people can talk. You know, we've done barbecues if it's nice. You know, we have fake meat and real meat. And, you know, we do, you know, little games, you know, simple games. We love to go to parks. We've, we've done bowling before. I hate bowling, but that <laughs> doesn't matter. Other people like it, so. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but, I mean, there's lots of stuff that you can do. Um, so many things. By the way, if you're not good at planning this stuff, find somebody who is. I am horrible at planning social fun stuff. I literally, honestly, when 2000 came, I was pastoring a church plant. When we had, we had a, a um, party at our church, we rented our church and had a party at New Year's Eve that I planned, everyone left by 10. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I am horrible at this. So, yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, find somebody who knows what they're doing. I never planned parties after that. So, I learned my lesson. <laughs> <laughs> that was last millennium. <laughs> All right. So um, when you have the social then, somewhere in the middle of the social, you get up and you just have somebody, if you can't do this, if you're not the cheerleader type, then have somebody who knows how to do it. But get up. Is everybody having a great time? Yay. Um, 
You know, and if it's that kind of party, if you're doing like game, board game day, <laughs> you know, that's, that doesn't quite fit in that kind of way. But, uh, <laughs> you know, just get, get people, you know, get some feedback, have some good time, and then, then say, hey, guess what we're planning on doing? What? We're going to have another social in two weeks with free food and everybody's like, yay! And you give everybody 10 invitations to the social that's coming up in, ten, in two weeks. And you say, listen, we want this to be huge. Let's make this thing go viral. Invite your friends. Give out the invitations. Invite them on, on Instagram, whatever it is. So bring, let's bring people and have a great time. Oh, and by the way, we're going to do something else next week for anybody who's interested. A bunch of us who are organizing this today, we decided we're going to serve the community in a unique way. We're going to be planting a brand new church, but it's not like churchy church. It is a church that serves people. And because you're going to have a lot of non-religious people there at your social. So you got to be make sure you very clear what you're doing um, and break down stereotypes. We just want to help the community and make the community into a family for us. And so we're deciding that next week we're going to practice this and see what it might look like. But we need feedback. We need people to come and tell us, are we doing it right? So we're going to give you some more invitations. And you give everybody 10 invitations and to next week's practice of this new type of church. Um, it's like, and we even put, like a church, like, uh, um, unlike any church you've ever seen um, on, on the invitation. And so we want your feedback. And so the reason at the socials we give invitations to both the, the church practice and the social is because a lot of people will not come to a church service, even if you're trying to make it sound good. And so if you don't invite them to the next social, you'll never see them again. So you've got to make sure you're inviting the people at socials to the next social. And so at the practice service the next week, don't do it on Sabbath morning. Do it. You can do it in the venue that you might be renting, which is fine if you can get it that early. But all you're doing is practicing, like a Friday night or Thursday night or Sunday morning. I don't care when you do it, because it's just practice. And what you're doing is you're actually shortening an actual service. So you're going to have your greeting teams. This is the first time that your greeting teams actually get to practice being greeters. You're going to have... Your Sabbath school, usually I don't start Sabbath school till the second practice service. I don't do it the first one. I add a little bit more every practice service. Um, but you're going to be practicing the things at shortened. Like our music, we're going to do two songs. We're not going to do five or six songs. It's going to be very short. And then everything we do, when people are gathered and we begin, we ask them to give us feedback. So right away we ask, we say, this is here so that you can help us understand what we're doing, if we're doing it right. Did we do greeting well? After the music, the, the worship leader will come up and s explain why do we do music in church. It's to help us recognize that God is here for us, and we want to connect with him. Do you think that this is a way that would make sense in this community? Get feedback, get ideas. Some people are going to give you really dumb feedback, but that's okay. You want that feedback anyway. Because it makes them feel like they're starting to have ownership of this new church. They're helping. Even if you don't use their ideas, they're helping you. But by the way, you're going to get some <laughs> great ideas. You know, when you do the sermon, eight-minute, ten-minute sermon, real short, get up and explain how, why you're doing the sermon the way you did and how you're trying to make it connect. Will people who don't know God understand what I just said? Or did I make it un totally, un you know, totally so high and out of reach that they couldn't understand me? All these things, you're asking very penetrating questions. You want feedback. And, but the main reason is, is because you want them to be engaged. You want people to be, feel like they're owners. And really they are, because this church is for them. It's not for you. And so you're getting that feedback. At the end of it, you also give them the handout where they can say, who do you know that we should be talking to that would be excited about a church like this? And then you give them 10 invitations to say, 
By the way, as a special thank you, we're going to hold a, a social for everybody here and all of your friends and family. We're giving you 10 invitation cards. Invite everybody you know, and we're going to be meeting at such and such a place at such and such a time, have free food and all these things. Um, and so you'll have the social week four. So this cycle then happens every month, that same cycle. Information meeting, five months to go. Information meeting, social, practice service, social. Four months to go, information meeting, social, practice service, social. You'll see it just keeps repeating and it cycles for five months like that. So you're doing this and people keep inviting people that you've never met. And so your circle grows and grows and grows and your launch team expands. If you do this well, your church when it launches will be three times larger than if you didn't do this step. This one step will have that impact on your church. It is that important. So, um, and we've had churches try and cut corners. Like, you notice, what does we do more than anything else? Socials. You see that? Socials are twice as much as everything. Yep. Why do you think we do so many socials? Don't you answer because you've heard this. <laughs> Whoever's not heard this before. Make friends. Yeah, we're trying to build relationships. Yep. This is what happens in church planting. If you don't build relationships with your core team and your launch team, once you launch and it becomes that weekly grind of doing church like you normally do, people begin to leave. Because they haven't developed relationships in the new church, they drift back to the relationships in the churches they were in before. So you lose a lot of key leaders that way. You don't lose new, not, new Adventists, but you'll lose key leaders often that were Adventists. Plus, you're, you're developing a spiritual family. And, of course, you're, there's a lot of things that socials do. It helps you connect with people far from Christ. So, does this make sense, this process? Yes. Now, things change a little bit right here. When you get to the last three practice services, oh, sorry, sorry, one, two, three, you notice that that last social, we do practice service, practice service, and then the next week, grand opening. We do these three practice services, they're identical. We are practicing the grand opening service. Those three, I'm not inviting comments about. We're not looking for comments anymore. We get comments on these, these three practice services, but now we know how to run the service and we are practicing for our grand opening. The comments that we get are from people who are part of the team already. We should tweak this and you can make tweaks for the next week. We should, but we're not looking for general comments, yeah. Um, you don't, you say no practice worship services on Sabbath morning. But these we do. Okay, so when does that? The last three. The last the last three, basically you're doing Sabbath morning, Sabbath morning, Sabbath morning at your venue. People have already, now they have left their church. They are part of this church officially. You know, we start get, doing giving right away. When we start doing our meetings, we ask people to start giving to the church right away. Okay. Um, so practice service, practice service, practice service. We do everything exactly like we're going to do on our grand opening. This is, a, this is just like a business, like my restaurants. We practiced before we had an opening. Yes. We had people who would call in, like, I want a pizza delivered to this hotel. And they would time everything. Could we get this done? We gave away free pizza coupons to lots of people in the community. And we wanted them to just show up. We're not open yet, but for, just for you. And you just show up and they'd come in waves. Can we handle the rush? All these things were practice ready for the grand opening. Amen. So this is something that we do too. We practice these three times exactly what we're going to do on grand opening. And our next step, I'll tell you why that is so important. I'm not going to tell you why yet. All right? Again, when you do this right, this will at minimum triple the, the number of people you have at your grand opening, and it'll greatly expand the number of people helping you in that launch team. All right? So any questions on this? Man, oh, wow. I, can't, I think it was one, two, three. Okay. Why not Sabbath morning? Okay, you got your yeah. thing. The, why, the, why the not first the three? Practice, the practice worship service is the because first Because a lot of people are still connected to their churches. Okay. Yeah. 
So. When do you do that so. Sunday morning? Sunday morning, Friday night, Thursday. It's, it's basically just practicing. But you can do a Sabbath morning if you, if you like, if I had a church plant that I had no Adventist, um, so it was no problem doing a Saturday morning then. But, yeah. The practice service sounds like it's really short because everything's super shortened. So It's about the same length because you're doing, you're getting feedback. Oh, after everything. Inter yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. And then the info meeting, is that just the core group? No. Info meeting, they invite everybody they can so that you can share with the community what you're going to be doing. Oh, okay. So yeah. in the, are you still having core meetings? Absolutely. So now core teams, yeah. core teams meeting okay. twice a week now. Okay. For training, twice a week. that's why they stop their ministries, whatever the ministries they're doing. Yeah. They come to training once a week. Now, if you can't handle once a week, do training every other week. Just slow down the process. But don't slow, don't do this every week. This is very important, I mean, the five-month process. Yeah. So I'm, I'm getting the impression, I'm getting the feeling that this five-month period could start very shortly after recruiting the core team. Yeah, yeah. it could it, it, if you had a really strong, heavily Adventist team. But it takes a while to train people to be disciples. Yeah. So I usually try and wait at least three months before I Got start you. five months. Okay. But it depends on the team, too. It, you could wait five months, though, and before you start it, too. Yeah. The one thing is don't wait more than 18 months. Yeah, if you wait 18 months, your team will be gone. Yeah. Do you have uh, the community, um, do you invite your neighborhood to come and watch your practices, or do you have a yeah. special audience? No, everybody, anybody. But we don't do mailers for practice services. It's got to be personal invitation. Right, it's like, hey, come check us out. We're practicing, give right. us some feedback. Yep. And these are just random people from the community. Yeah, <clears throat> we want random people because that will give us information. Yeah. Um, I know you, well, you mentioned that at, at the beginning you preach eight-minute sermons, right? Just for practice, just those for first practice. three practice services. So do you end up lengthening the sermons towards the end? Yeah, or? maybe the third one it might be instead of eight minutes, it might be 13 minutes. But again, I'm getting feedback those first services. Gotcha. So the last one, though, it'll be a full-length sermon. It'll be you'll, They're going to hear the same sermon four times in a row. Okay. They're going to hear the same songs four times in a row. And there's a reason for that. In the next step, you'll understand why. Yeah. Please. All right. All right. So let's go to our groups. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. So... You mentioned that the the last three meetings are uh, are done at the venue. Yes. Right? So what what do you do the other ones at? You can do it at the venue or somewhere else. It's nice if you can do it at the venue. Right. But, but sometimes you, you don't. Listen, I've had two of my church plants. We didn't know where we were meeting three weeks before grand opening. <laughs> we had no idea. So, so it happens sometimes. You just. But I didn't freak out because I knew God would find us right. a place. And the core team is the one that um, supports the the renting of the place, or you have like a like a mother church that is. I don't ever use mother churches. No? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just I don't want to transfer their culture into this new church. <laughs> it's not that it's wrong. I just I don't do it that way. Other people do it that way very effectively. Yeah. Yeah. We you got that. Yeah. Just a quick question. With, with these practices, at what time do you introduce the Bible study for uh, Sabbath school? During, during usually the second practice service. Oh, okay. Yep. Because I'm thinking of children's ministries and stuff. Yeah, they need to practice those things, frankly. Okay. And you can actually have them the first week. You just don't advertise in the first week. It's just for the core team people. Yeah. All right. For the finances, how do you handle that? Usually, you know, part of the mother church, uh, part of the mother church responsibility, well, not responsibility, but help or aid is, yeah. you know, keeping your money or keeping your the tap of your time. It, it depends on the conference. Every conference is different. I can't answer that question because, like, in our conference, we just made it so that any mission group can open a bank account. Okay. So most conferences, you have to be a company before you open a bank account. So if you don't have a mother church, I don't like mother churches holding money because I've had too many conflicts where they're saying, no, that's our money. You're our people and you gave it, it's our money. 
I hate that. So I'd rather them have a bank account. And if they don't work out, we just shut the bank account. Just make sure that there's an officer of the conference who's on that bank account. So if it, if it shuts down, it can be closed down by them. All right, I really need to keep going. We're timing this, so um, let's look at our table group discussion, step eight. You have uh, three questions there. You have eight minutes to go through those. So let's get started. Thank you. We're going to start on this side. All right, let's start in the middle. We keep starting in the ends. Okay, so this is a question for everybody. You listening? This, everybody answered at the same time. This is not a trick question. Even if you said, we don't want to meet then because it's summer, I just want the actual date. What would be the earliest you would even consider? August 15th, right? Yeah. All right, no, not a hard one. Now, of course, you may look at that in your area and say, that doesn't make sense. We want to start after school's in session and stuff like that, right? All right, so what is the purpose? Let's start with this group right here. What is the purpose of information meetings? Yeah, so you're sharing with the community. Yeah, what, yeah. what are you, you know, the mission, all the, the stuff you're going to be doing. Values, the yeah, what the new church is going to be, right? Yeah. Yeah, good, good. All right, what's the purpose of doing socials? Connecting, having fun, laughing together, and being I don't know where the friends. thing is. Okay. Still relationships. All right, good, good. Do you have one of the clicker things or whatever they're things? <coughs> Recorders? What? Whatever they things are. You guys have one of the mics? Yeah, there's one. Let me have that real quick. That's turned off. I don't know why it's blinking. Okay, there it goes. Okay, so what is the purpose of the practice services? To work out the, the, the details, the, the flaws, the, the, um, make sure we're, we're, we're on track. And, and meeting the needs, and, and to get feedback as well from the people. Okay, good. Okay, why potential, what are some potential advantages, just shout them out, to uh, starting a new group with a bigger group than a small group, new church? The bigger groups attract more people. Yeah, that is a big thing. Big groups attract people. You launch a church with a small group of people, it is. And visitors come in, they think that there's no momentum, no excitement. They see a small group, and they're not as excited. That's a big reason why to start larger. What other reasons? Less burnout. Less burnout, because you got more people to help. And you're able to, yeah, what else? Sorry? They have more friends to invite. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You have a bigger reach, right? You got more people, you're reaching more people. What other reasons might there be? Diversity is a strength. There'll be more points of connection. Oh, with yeah. People. Yeah, good. Diversity is a strength. Good. There's a lot of reasons why you want to start. For one of the, one of the biggest reasons, hasn't been mentioned yet, you'll be able to plant another church a lot sooner. Oh. Because if you start large, yep. you, you can quickly move towards planting again. In a year, two, three years, when you start small, you're struggling. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot more time to build that church up large enough that you can send out a healthy team for the next church. Mm -hmm. Now, I am all for, once you plant a church, using that as a mother because you've already developed a healthy culture. Mm -hmm. The reason I don't usually use an existing church as a mother church is because they don't have the culture we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Now, once in a while, you find churches that are very healthy, and they are good at sending churches. That's fine. You, that's, yeah. I just haven't run into those myself. So. But I'm sure they're out there. There's plenty of them. All right. So let's jump into uh, step number nine. Now, don't freak out, everybody. Please calm yourselves. Because now we are opening the church. Woo! Yeah. Baby. Hey. Now, don't rush this. What did I just say? Don't rush this. 
Don't rush the first service. Take your time. Do this right. You can even do, if you find out you're not ready, just make your five-month pre-launch into a six-month pre-launch or a seven-month pre-launch. Just keep doing that cycle and keep going until you're ready. It's okay to say, and I screwed up. My last church plant, I screwed up on this one. We had two major things happen um, that messed us up. Um, and we had one, the conference saw our practice service and made us strip it all out and restart over. And two, we lost our venue three weeks before our grand opening. I should have just extended, but I was so, I don't know how to put the words. I was so upset at the challenges and thinking, well, we can make this happen anyway. It really impacted our grand opening because a lot of people left our court team because they're like, well, if you're going to let the conference tell us what kind of church we're going to be, you know, they don't even understand what we're trying to do. And then others like, man, you just moved 20 minutes away. That's too far away. I should have kind of restarted that five-month process and, and gone through it again. But I thought, well, the conference wants us to hurry up and get this planted. And I relied too much on my experience as a planter thinking I could get around it. We still did fine. I mean, we had a grand opening of, I don't know, 80 instead of 200 like I used to. But it took us a while. It took us six months to double the average attendance. It took longer than it should have. Um, that's something that I can do a lot faster normally. So anyway, oh, let me set my timer or I'll forget. So the very first thing you want to do is come up with a plan to share with the world what you're doing. So you're going to advertise. Advertise, advertise, advertise. Marketing to everybody. So when I get closer to this time, I am giving my launch team and my um, core team, which is part of the launch team, I'm giving every one of those every week 20 invitations to the grand opening. All the new people we're meeting at the different things we're doing, we're giving, as we're getting close to that grand opening, like three weeks, four weeks away, 20 invitations to the grand opening. We want the grand opening to be massive. The more people that you can get there, the better. So we, we send out mailers. I find out any way I can, put up posters in Starbucks, whatever it takes to get the word out that we're starting a brand new church. People get curious about church plants, but you have to do it right. Um, the problem is that most plants that get a big opening day crowd never plan on how to keep that crowd coming back. And so let me give you a story. I went to a church plant um, that was opening up in a neighborhood that I lived, a Sunday church. They, are, they mailed out flyers. And I saw a brand new church opening at a school right down the hill from me. And I thought, oh, this will be cool. So I put it in my calendar, and I walked into the school, and they had a couple of, of small signs with arrows. said the river, I think is what they called themselves, the river. And, and uh, I mean, it was like those little small yard signs. They had two of those with an arrow pointing towards the school. And I thought, well, that signage isn't very good, but at least I knew kind of where to go. I walked in the door where the, where the arrows were pointing, and nobody was there. It was just an empty school. The door was unlocked, and I started wandering around the school trying to find out where they were meeting. And I finally heard some stuff happening, and I walked into their cafeteria, and that's where the church was happening. I walked in maybe... 10 minutes before the service was supposed to start according to the card and they were still setting up, rushing around setting up um, for their grand opening. Um, I watched them as they put two trash cans on the platform. They would bought one of those nice stages. And they put two trash cans on it and a piece of wood in front of it. And I was like, what is that for? And then they began the service and they had a puppet show with this guy standing behind these two trash cans. They were not hidden really well by this wood. It was so cheesy looking. And that was their children's story with these puppets, one guy doing two puppets talking to each other. Um, 
The music was actually pretty good. Then the pastor gets up to do the sermon. This is their grand opening week, first Sunday. And he gets up and he says, we are now um, on the second week of our series entitled. And I'm like, what? This was their grand opening. And they're on the second week of a series. They had been meeting as a team, and they didn't even bother to think about what would people who are new coming in think about this. You know, I didn't see those signs for that church last more than about six months. That's not how you launch a church. You launch like that, I mean, I had zero desire to ever come back to that thing. It was like they were really there for themselves. And, and it's kind of that idea, you know, if, if we start it, people will come. That's not true. It doesn't work that way. You actually have to have something that people will want to come back to. And so we want to make sure that our grand opening is done very well. That's why we practice it over and over. Three different full practices before we ever do it in, in live. And so what should the message be? So our grand opening Sabbath, we always do a sermon about how this church is called to reach out and serve the community. And so what I do is I usually use a story about Jesus as a servant. And so I love the story of blind Bartimaeus. It is my favorite story um, in the Bible. I just absolutely love it. And there's so much packed into that story. So I talk about the visual. You know, when you're telling a story from the Bible, add the details. Let people see what's happening on that road. They're seeing the animals. They're hearing kids running. They're smelling the smells of the market. You know, there are people pressing. You know, they, they say that there was at least 100,000 people walking down that road that day. Um, and so people are pressing in. Jesus is getting famous. And people are pressing in. I can see his disciples kind of making a circle around him to protect him from the crush of the crowds. People are, are trying to get his attention. People are talking to each other. You know, families are connecting that haven't seen each other for a while. There's so much happening. Dirt's flying up, you know, because people are walking down the road. And then there's this guy who's a beggar and blind sitting at the side. You know, he probably was brought there um, by maybe a friend or a family member so that he could earn enough money to survive. And he's been asking people as they walk by, this is probably a good time for beggars, you know, because there's a lot more traffic. Hopefully they can get some attention, asking for money. And then he starts hearing people talk about Jesus is coming. And the stories were circulating about Jesus and what he's done. And Bartimaeus starts getting excited. And he starts screaming, trying to get Jesus' attention. I can just imagine his heart. This is my chance. Jesus will be walking by me. I'm going to do everything I can to see if he'll help me. He starts screaming. And the people start telling him to shut up. You're a beggar, right? The lowest of lows, a blind beggar. Jesus is a great rabbi. Be quiet, you're disturbing people. What does he do? He screams even more. And then for me, the key, how I see God is in this, these words. When the Bible says this, Jesus stopped. For me, that tells me exactly who God is. That he wasn't too busy for Bartimaeus. He stopped. When all these thousands of people are pressing around him, there's somebody crying out for mercy. A blind beggar, the lowest of lows. And Jesus stops and says, bring him here to me. And then I tell people, this church has come to this community to stop. We are here to stop and listen to the needs of the people. People are crying out for mercy, for healing, 
for companionship, for whatever their needs are. And we are a church that will stop. And then we begin to explain about the key ministries in our church and how each of them will be stopping for this community, serving the people just as Jesus served blind Bartimaeus, reaching out and finding out what their needs are. And so we introduce each, each ministry, and let's say we're doing, let's say we have five or six key ministries. We're going to have banners around the room. Let's say this is our church room. We'll have banners around the room, and those banners will have the name of that ministry on it. And so if I introduce children's ministry and I start talking about, you know, not a long thing, but maybe two or three minutes of how we are going to be serving the families of, of this community and some of the broken things, talk about the issues that families face in this community and ways that the children's ministries are going to help serve those needs. And I want to introduce you to somebody important today. I want to introduce you to Pam. Pam, would you stand up? And Pam stands up. And Pam is going to be the leader of um, our group of church, church ministry to children. And everybody, give her a hand, say thank you, or wave, whatever your tradition <coughs> is better. Um, and then Pam, silently, after I start talking about the next ministry, Pam goes and walks, and here's her banner that says children's ministry. She goes and stands next to it and just waits. And we talk about how each ministry is going to help serve the needs of the people Stop for the community as Jesus stopped for Bartimaeus. And introduce the leaders for each of the ministries, and they go and stand by them. Now, this is a complicated process. This is why we practice it three times. Um, <clears throat> so then, at the end, we have a closing that where it's very short and succinct at the end. We don't do singing at the end. We have a very fast prayer at the end, no announcements. What we're doing is we're inviting people to get up and go to the different ministries. So we say something like, what would we like you to do as a birthday present? This is our birthday, our first, first service, brand new. And if you wouldn't mind as a birthday present, just go say thank you to one of these ministry leaders. They have something short that they want to share with you as well. And so when I say go... We've practiced with all of our core team members and all of our launch members. As soon as I say go, they go. So as soon as so let's do that right now. People start getting up and start walking in different directions to the different ministries. We do that because people are people that follow people. That's just a normal thing. You know, it's you're much more likely to get help if you're hurt if there's only one person witnessing it than if there's a crowd. Because people, when it's one person, they just act. But when it's a group of people, they begin to look at each other to see what everybody else is going to do. But what are they doing? They're looking at you to see what you're going to do. And so it takes a lot longer for people to react. Is that, is that real? You, you know, are they really hurt? You know, who's going to help? And so the, the response time is much less, takes a lot longer, I should say, if you have a group of people watching than if it's just one person. So we want people to watch people, so people start getting up. Now, not everybody who comes, you have a lot of people there that are, that are just curious. Not everybody that comes will go to one of those things, but most of them will go. And so if I'm over here, now I am Pam. I've got a group now gathering around me. Well, at the same time, I also have two assistants that have come next to me, too. <clears throat> And those assistants have in their hands some cards. These cards are ministries that are very low-level ministry cards. Um, they'll be they'll be very, very simple. And what Pam is going to do is going to give another 30-second thank you. We are so blessed to be um, able to serve the kids of this community in such and such a ways. Um, but we've realized something. We can't do it. Everything you hear is only a dream because we don't have enough people to make it all happen. But if we work together, we can actually serve this, these kids and these families this way. So we have some very simple things that we're going to be doing that if we share the load, 
it will make a big impact. You know, we've learned that kids love to, to learn while they're doing stuff. You know, the, the sociologists and psychologists say the kids retain information better if they can work with their hands while they're learning. And so we're going to be teaching while they're doing crafts and projects, but we need people, if we give them the materials, to just help us make those projects beforehand. So very simple. We give, give some people materials, you take them home, you build them and bring them back, and then the kids will have those ready to use. Um, so we just need, and then based on the size of the crowd, is how many people Pam is going to ask for. If it's a small crowd, she might ask for two or three helpers. If it's a huge crowd, she might ask for ten helpers in this thing. And she says, but we need some people that can assist us in building crafts. Who, who is willing to help us with that? Now, we have people in the, in the crowd that are part of the core team and the launch team. If nobody raises their hands, then they're trained to do this. They count to two. 1,001, 1,002. Nobody raised their hand yet. They go, they take a step forward and say, I'll help with their hand up. <coughs> that gets the prime, you know, the pump primed, as they say. It gets other people to be willing to do it because what again is happening is they're all looking. Is anybody else going to do this? Is it okay for me to speak up? And so that, that's somebody who's ready to do that if nobody else says they'll help. Then other people say, oh, yeah, I can help with that too. Then the assistant has in their hands cards that say craft team leader or craft team assistant, whatever you want to call it. And it has a description of what's going on and, and the contact information for the leader. It's perforated. On the bottom it says craft team leader, and where they fill out their information. So the assistant will bring that card to you and hand you a pen and say, if you would, just fill out the bottom part for me. You get to keep the top part because it explains more, and then give it back to me. And she's, she or he, who's the assistant, is being quiet and explaining that to you. And they're keeping an eye on who is getting these cards and make sure they're getting them back. While the leader is now talking about the next thing. Now, of course, with children's ministry, if you have any of those that are actually working with the kids, you explain that they have to go through whatever process your conference uses to screen kids, to screen for kids to be safe. But like craft team, they don't, never, they don't have to do the crafts for the kids. They're just helping make them at their house. So very simple, low-level ministries. We're not asking people to run Sabbath schools, but just to help. What this does, and we did this by accident at one church, because we uh, didn't plan far enough in advance to get the team strong enough. And I said, why don't we just do it right after service and see what happens? We were shocked at how many people wanted to help build this new church that had no Christian background even. And so we then started intentionally doing this, and it really is effective. You get... You get so we had a church that just launched at 313 using all these processes that we talked about. Um, but they did miss two things. They didn't do the socials as many times as we told them to do. And then two, they didn't do the grand opening the way we said we just showed you. And people could do things on their own. But I was at that grand opening. And the uh, pastor's wife came to me afterwards and said, man, I, they were shocked. They didn't realize the process worked this well. And, you know, such a big crowd. And she said, what's going to happen next week, though? And I said, I don't know, but I can tell you what's going to happen next month. And she said, what? I said, you'll be down to 125 out of 313. And she said, what? And I said, yeah, you'll be down to 125. No, they, had, they were at 312 opening day. Um, so a month later, I asked them how many they had. They had 112. They had dropped that much because they didn't do anything to capture that crowd. And when you do this, you get people involved in low-level ministries right away. They have ownership of the church. They feel like they are part of the church. It's very important to do this. So we make sure that this is done. And so this, is, again, is kind of how it's set up. You know, if you're speaking here, have the banners. Do four to six. You know, if you do three, that's a little bit too little. More than six, even six is almost too many. But if you're going to have 300 people, you think, then six is okay. If you think you're going to have 800 people, then you can do even more. 
Um, and, and listen, I know that we think that this is unusual because that's not how Adventist churches have started. You go to a Sunday keeping church planter and they might, they might say only 300. For them, that's, that's what they want. That's what they expect. You'll get what you expect. You will get much bigger crowds if you do the process right. Um, and so, now you don't have to use this again. I've told you many times. This is just how we train. You can take pieces if you want, but I can guarantee you if you're not strategic about capturing that opening day crowd, you get what's called looky-loos. People will come to see this new thing, but they're not planning on staying. You've got to you've got to do something to help motivate them to come back. And so getting them involved in a ministry right away helps them do that. All right? So any questions? Yes. I don't know where it is. <laughs> Who's got a mic? All right, there. thank you. <coughs> Yeah, you guys don't need to push these buttons when you're talking. They're already on. So much buildup now. I don't know if you can <laughs> ask the question. Um, uh, how how are, are the, how's the conferences? I mean, as far as timing, you know, because you say five months, but the the risk you run is it may be seven or eight months before you want to do the mm -hmm. the church grand <laughs> opening. Right. Um, I know conferences are reluctant when it comes to pastoral coverage they're also reluctant to put money into areas that are unexplored uh, they want to use bible workers they want to use you know what i'm saying I'm, i mean so when you say well if i come in as a church planter uh it's going to take me a year before i get a church up and running but then when i am up and running you're going to have 300 I'm just trying to look at it in a traditional understanding of, of conferences. There, yep. there aren't very many conferences that be willing to say, you know what, I'll pay your full salary for you to go around and jibber jabber with people in the neighborhood. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right. There are there are a lot of conferences that won't won't see that, and a lot of you will be planting a church that you already have a church. So you're going to have to do this while you already have a church, um, and you just have to make it work. But it works. I've seen it happen many times. You can make this work. The first thing I do if I was running a church or a district is I would train leaders to take over. So I'd be freed up much more time to be able to do this. If you're doing, if you're doing prayer meeting and you know, Friday night service and all these things as a pastor, you're not doing what the Bible says you're supposed to be doing. You're not doing what Ellen White says you're supposed to be doing. I'll just be honest. You're doing what the Catholic and Protestant churches say you're supposed to be doing. That is not Adventism. Adventism is training the people to do ministry. That's why I only preach half the time. That's ministry. I don't go to every hospital visit. I don't do all the visitation. That is, I am called to <coughs> equip the members to do the work of ministry. Yeah. Just a quick one on that. What I found is that whatever the pastor does regularly weakens the church in mm, that area. I agree completely. And so, you know, so if you want to do something, I love to play piano, mm -hmm. uh, but I rarely get to play in churches. And But if I took over the music ministry and I did all the music, when I leave, that church is going to be very weak in music. You're area. exactly right. You're exactly right. Very good point. Yes, the question. I think um, when pastors hear that, they they get really complacent, and they just they feel like they all their gift is is to train people, but not to do anything else or visitation or any of those things. And really, what they need to do is go alongside That's their how leaders you get training, right. and train them. They're right. they're still working because people, when they see the pastor doing it then they'll be more likely to do it also yeah. so that's just the other side of it that i've seen that you know they sit back and read a book while oh you guys are supposed to be doing Small the work <laughs> yeah, no, really no. okay my other question is how at what point is the core team closed launch day so people can join the core team no. anytime through you that? you hand pick the core team so you usually stop picking people <clears throat> for the core team five months before you launch 
Okay. So now you can join the launch team anytime okay. before you launch. Okay. But even a launch team ends at grand opening. Now you're now you you'll be working through this process with your core team. But once you launch, then you launch also your leadership structure, whatever that might look like. So, so. after after launch day. Then your new ministry leaders are your ministry team leaders. Or if, your, if that's how you set it up. Your board. Yeah. Right? If that's how you set it up, yeah. I got you. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions? All right. Oh, yes. Sorry. It's a quick question. Uh, do you have any experiences implementing these things into already no. running church plants? No. Ru already running church plants? Like, like a church plant that's already... Grand opening, no. Like it's no. Already passed. no. Your culture is already set. I'm not saying you can't, but I don't have any experience doing it, and I wouldn't do it myself. That's it's too confusing for a church plant. You can maybe take a piece at a time. I mean, there's a there's a way to create culture change. It just takes a lot longer. And again, the saying that we say is, it's easier to give birth than raise the dead. <laughs> And so if something is dead in a church, it's easier to, to birth a new church that does it right. And then that church, though, will see what you're doing and want to adopt it if it's effective. So the best way to change existing churches is plant healthy new churches. So, yeah, it it's, sounds harsh, but it's a reality. All right, so let's go to our table group discussions. You see that... Um, Step nine, great grand opening. You have three questions on that, and you have eight minutes for that one. So what story might you use? Question one. Uh, well, some people say the prodigal son. Good, that's enough. Perfect. I like it. All right. What might happen if you're not intentional about getting first-time guests to come back? They won't come back. That's right. Pretty simple, right? <laughs> All right. So if you use a suggested in product process for your first service, what training will you need for key ministry leaders? They need to know exactly where to go. They need to know when to go there. They need to know what to say, how to say it. And what to have in their hands. And all the materials that are necessary. All where that are, stuff. When to grab them, how to distribute yep. them. When to stand up, yep. how to smile. Yep. Everything. How long to count before they stand up and I'll do it. Yeah, but the key ministry leader is only here. But yeah, you're jumping into some of the other things. Good, good. Good, good. Okay, what training will you need for their assistant leaders? Oh, wait, wait, I don't have, here's your thing. Sorry. To have to engage people in me and also to how to keep the enthusiasm with the people is coming in. Now these are the assistants. They're the ones that are holding oh, yeah. the cards. Remember the, the cards that have perforation? What do they need to do? You told me assistant leaders? Yes. Um, Walk them through filling it out and the perforation yeah. part. Yeah, I, yeah. Someone's not paying attention over there. Marcus. Now they're saying it. He's the leader. He's the leader. He's the leader. Okay. How to walk the uh, people through the card, fill it out, tear right. off their perforation, etc. Yeah, all those things, yeah. And, and make sure you keep in track of the people so you're not losing people. You know, I didn't mention while I'm walking over to ask this group the next question. I didn't mention that we actually have another ministry at the end for everybody who didn't volunteer. <laughs> we have a ministry ready for them. We don't ask their permission to give them a card. We just hand them a card for that ministry. So uh, we're so glad that there's three of you left because we still have one very important thing. <laughs> and so we'll give you those cards now. So everybody's going to get a card. All right, and then what, if, what are you going to have to train the core and launch team to do? Yes. I think we were a little bit confused on that last part. Okay, so remember, so they're trained to get up when you say go, they go. That's one thing they have to be trained in doing. The timing of going. And that they're all going to different places. We want the crowd to kind of be heading in different directions. 
Two, they need, some of them need to be ready to be the volunteers that hold their hand up and say, I'll do it. So that's practiced. All this stuff is practiced beforehand. It's very, very important. All right? Good. All right. Let's go to step number 10. The last step, 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 step. All right. Oh, what happened? Uh-oh. Your computer asked if you wanted to go to sleep mode or oh. restart or something. All right. Now you can see a budget request. There you go. All right. Let's get back to this. By the way, while he's doing that, at 1 o'clock, we're heading to the Southwestern Adventist University cafeteria. They're going to accommodate us even though it's a little bit later than their lunch. Hmm. So they're weird. expecting never seen that us all. All right, so multiplication, step 10. Let me set my timer here. Okay. All right, so you've already had, you have already had your first service now. But you're training for this step before you have your first service. In your core team, you're training about how you're going to be a multiplication church. By the way, I am try not trying to train you today on how to um, plant a church. We're training you on how to plant a movement. Mm. And that's what every church should be. You're starting not a church, but a movement. These churches should be in their minds always. We are the first of many. And so this mindset also starts at the very first service. So at the grand opening, when we take an offering, we talk about how excited we are that we're going to be able to help this community. But you know what? There's a lot of communities out there that don't have a church like this that cares about their needs. So today we're going to take up an offering not for us, but we're going to take up an offering for another church in the future that we're going to start in a different community. We want to take up an offering to help that community in the future. So when we take that very first offering, it doesn't even go for the new church plant. It goes for the next church plant. So from the very first week, it's in the mindset of everybody who came that this is a movement. We are not starting one church. And then every six months, we take that same offering again, forever. Always doing that for the next church plant so that there's a little bit of funding, but more importantly, so that that mindset never leaves the church. So what does multiplication look like? Well, members should learn, a member should learn how to bring in new members. They need to learn how to make friends to do Christ's method alone. Get out involved in people, meet their needs, develop relationships, show them that they care about them, um, and then, when it's appropriate, begin the spiritual journey with them towards Christ. Leaders need to train new leaders. Every single job description we have in our church, when you're the leader, the job description first line says, train your replacement. That is your number one role. Train somebody to do what you're doing. Disciples. You're not a disciple if you're not making new disciples. So always work on that area. And then churches are called to plant new churches. That's the multiplication model that you see in the Bible Jesus used. All right? All right. Amen. So the first and most important step for organic multiplication and church revitalization both is obeying God. He's asked us to be multipliers. We are called to do this kind of work. And if we want to see this happen, we've got to obey him. I want to ask yourself, when has it ever worked out well for man to do their own thing instead of God's thing? <laughs> But we talked about already, God has a path. He gave us a message and a method. And if we say, you know what, that sounds good and keep doing the same, same thing we've always done, we're not obeying God. We're just not. And it's difficult to hear. 
Um, but nobody's at fault. This conference isn't at fault. And how many people here were alive when Ellen White died? Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm the only one. <laughs> no, she died a hundred years ago. And nobody here was born, let alone in leadership, to make these kind of changes. It's the culture that all of us have adopted. It's the culture that they teach you at the seminary. Oh, mercy. And it not, it's not their fault either, <laughs> because they weren't born when these changes happened. This is just something that we've adopted because the culture, the culture shifted in the Western world. Not everywhere, but in the Western world. And so as we adopt this methodology, which is really, the, the, really kind of started with Constantine, the Roman church moved into, into uh, a lot of the Protestant churches, then we adopted it as well after Ellen White died. It's the normal Adventist culture. It is tough to fight culture. That's why I'm telling you it's so important to build culture before you plant a church. You know, when I planted, Seattle was the one church I stayed in for a long term because my kids were in school. And when I took that call, I told the conference president, I'll say yes if you give me 10 years. And they gave me 10 years. I said 10 years is fine. Because I knew that that's when my last kid would be graduating high school. Um, and so my kids went through school. You know, we, we planted other campuses out of that church as well. But when we did that, and I stayed in that church for, for that time period, how many church fights do you think we had? A bunch. Zero. Oh. Not once. Wow. Because we all had the same culture and mission. We were, in, we were a movement. We weren't just a stagnant church. Awesome. When people don't, aren't doing the things that they read in the Bible, there becomes this dissonance inside of them. This, this, people know they're not doing the right thing. They're not on mission. They're not making disciples. They're not multiplying. And I really think it causes dissension in the group. People begin to fight amongst each other because they're not doing what God has called them to do. And, and so you have churches blowing up over stupid stuff. I mean, think about some of the things you've heard why churches split. Not in Texas. Oh, yeah, not in Texas. Thank, thank goodness. So when we obey God, though, and people are, are active in ministry, they're active in building relationships with the church members and outside the church, when that stuff happens, you just don't have the same, same things. You don't have the same issues. It's very nice. So everybody, every biblical her hero um, used by God had to fight the traditional religious system. You read the Bible, and you'll see over and over and over and over that these heroes were fighting against the traditions that had drawn people away from God. And God is calling you to be the biblical hero now. But you won't be in the Bible. You'll be a heavenly hero, I guess, is a better way of saying it. So, um, I'm not going to go into much more detail on that. Multipl multiplying churches multiply. They have a plan. If you do not multiply... Within four years, the odds of you multiplying goes down dramatically. Within four years. Within four years. Mm -hmm. So I, we try and get our, plant, our plants to plant in two or three years. Mm -hmm. So you can do it even faster than that. There's, there's churches that are planting every year. There's a guy in Pittsburgh, not an Adventist. I mean, I saw him at Exponential. And when I saw him, there was two presenters. And I thought, why is that guy sitting up there? I thought maybe he's a friend of the main presenter. And this guy is talking about this great leader of churches and stuff. And then he introduces the guy I was thinking didn't belong. He was kind of not frumpy looking. He had a, like a drooping eye. And, and I was like, man, this guy's got to have a story. His story was he got shot in the head. And he wasn't active in church. And it was 10 years before. He'd been shot in the head. And he, they thought he was going to die. 
And he was on the gurney in the ambulance, and he just made a deal with God. God, if you save me, I am going to give my life to your service. Ten years later, he had planted a church in Pittsburgh, in one of the toughest neighborhoods in Pittsburgh, and they were planting 20 to 30 churches a year out of his church. They were planting a movement. They, would just, they created a little school inside their church where you would learn how to run a church. They'd be training 30 people at a time or so, and then they'd say, take anybody you can out of our church and go plant a church. And how did God bless them? Their church had over 1,000 in attendance and was growing rapidly while they're sending out hundreds of people Amen. every year to plant churches. Okay. This is how God works. When we obey him, he gives us a great bountiful harvest. Amen. It is a lot like the tithing principle. When we send people, like when we give our tithe, the 90% always is more impactful than the 100%. It's the same thing. When we give and we send people, the sending churches, if you want to make your church smaller, don't plant because it's not going to make your church smaller. The first church I planted was out of Doug Bing's church. First time I planted. Didn't know anything about what I was doing. He said, take anybody you want. I took 90 people out of his church. And I told him, I'm taking too many people. I took all of his children's ministry, leaders, assistants, all of them. And, and I was like, you've got to keep some of this. He said, no, take whoever wants to go. And this church had 340 in attendance. We took 90 of them out and went and started a plant. So I left them 250. Within six months, they were back to 340. Within a year, their tithe had gone back to where it was before we left. And there's another church active on the other side of town now. Yes. If they had just done evangelism, they might have grown a little bit. They were never going to grow by those numbers. Yep. But because they were very intentional about sending, the church grew and flourished. Amen. I mean, it, it, is, it is honestly the best way to grow a church is to send people out. It doesn't make sense in our world, but it makes perfect sense in God's world. Sure. Be missional and God will bless you. He's working in so many hearts already. Amen. It's not like the Holy Spirit's been waiting for you to show up. He's already working in people. He just doesn't have the right place to send them yet. And we need to start creating opportunities for the Holy Spirit to direct people to the Adventist Church. We have a beautiful message. If we just used his method, we'd be filled to the brim and exploding. Amen. So, All right, questions? Let me get you the. I know that you mentioned that uh, you don't have a board meeting, but you know there are some, uh, I guess, uh, protocols that we do with in connection with the uh, with the conference. You know, accepting members and right. doing things that usually we you know we do it through the board. So how do you uh, manage to do that? I don't want to tell you. <laughs> Every, every conference is different. They didn't care that I usually that I do stuff. We, we just never brought it up. Our members, when the people become members of the church plants, they're at such a higher level than most members are because they are accepting to be part of a small group, part of a ministry, part of an outreach team. So we actually have kind of a dual membership feel. You can be baptized, but you're not a member. I know that's not the Adventist way. But, you know, we are right with people being baptized when they're ready to say yes to Jesus. But if they're not ready to be a full member of the church, they're not going to be. But usually by the end time, it's very rare that we have a gap. But once in a while, we'll have a gap of a few months. That's okay. It happens. So, but, uh, yeah. Frankly, I mean, I know I work at a conference now. I, I'm not a big fan of a lot of this stuff, the different levels of church and all these things. So the conference would always have to tell me, you're going to be a church. I never asked. I could care less because it didn't change how I was acting. You know, you're going to go to a company status now. Okay, whatever. 
You're going to be at church status now. All right, that's fine. Do whatever you need to do. It doesn't, doesn't affect the ministry. You know, it's more of a, I don't know what it is. But, uh, you know, so those things I just didn't think a lot about, honestly. I just did what, you know, if they told me to do something, I did it. But, All right. Yeah. So my question has to do with what's the, when you have a current Adventist church, what do you think is the wisdom and how close another church plant should be? Because we have rules and regulations at different conferences, so I'm curious. So we just wrote our policy manual. You cannot plant next to an existing church unless you're reaching a completely different culture. So if you're reaching young adults and it's a more older church, you can plant across the street. If you're planting it for a different language or culture group like that, you can plant it across the street. But if you are planting the identical church reaching the same people, then we want some distance. We, don't, we didn't set the, the parameters on how far, though. Yeah. Any other questions? For your immediate core members, for your core members, uh, the, when you're recruiting them or interviewing them, do you also set a, a responsibility or a, require them to be faithful with their tithes and with no. their offerings? No. That'll, be, that'll happen while we're training the core team. So they, we do all we, the only requirement we give is that they show up at the training. That's the requirement. To be a core team, you, first you've got to be excited. We'll learn that in the interview process. You've got to want to do what we're doing, but you've got to show up at the training and participate in the training. That's the, that's the requirement. So we'll, we'll, we'll help shape them. Again, Jesus said make disciples. So we are actually going to be making, actively making disciples. So that's the process, yeah. Thank you. So I was going to ask, um, since it's extremely difficult and you wouldn't recommend uh, trying to change the culture that's already established in a church plant or a church, uh, would you recommend getting that church to turn their, um, turn their hearts towards planting another church? Every church is different. I can't answer that one. There's, every church has a unique situation. So some yes, some no. I can't tell you which, which would be right for that situation. Do they need to be healthy before you say yes? Well, if they're going to plant as a mother church, they need to be healthy. If they're just sending people, they can be anything they want, as long as you've picked a core team that will fit your new culture. So it does, they don't have to. We've had healthy people come out of unhealthy churches. Mm -hmm. So it's, it depends. Every, you know, There's no right answer. All right, so let's get into our last... Uh, group session, table group session. And we have uh, eight minutes on this one as well. Okay, all together. We are not teaching you how to start a church, but a movement. movement. Good. Use that a lot when you're yeah. training. A lot. Make sure that that is normal part of your conversations with people. So let's go to this table. Finish this thought. A church without a plan to multiply what? Will add or subtract. Yeah. Will what? Say it louder. Here. Will add or subtract. Instead of multiplying, they'll just add or subtract. Okay. Good, good. Maybe even divide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe even divide. Okay. What are three, what are one, what is one thing you could do in your new church to keep the goal of multiplying high on your members' thoughts and priorities? One thing. We uh, came up with celebrate. Just celebrate it. Yes. Celebrate multiplication. Good. Celebrate sending. Another one thing. Um, planning it. Have a plan with a timeline. Have a plan with a timeline. Good. <laughs> to keep multiplying. <laughs> and another thing. The first, the first offering, make sure that it is for the next church. Nice, <laughs> nice. You guys are geniuses. <laughs> Good stuff. They're creative. Yes, I like it. Six months, every six months after that. <laughs> All right. So what I'd like you to do as we're, we're closing today is we're going to do a checkout system. And what I'd like you to do is just tell us in 15 to 30 seconds one thing that you're going to be taking away from this and how you're going to be using it. But I keep saying keep it short. Because I will not make my flight if you go on and on. All right, so let me give you one of these and just start passing this around. We're going to start over here.
I'll take the greeting diagram. Okay. And how are you going to use it? I'm going to train my greeters. All right. Excellent. Yeah. Culture matters, celebrating multiplication by sharing every, all the time, reinforcing it. We're here, not here to be stagnant. We're here to grow. Amen. Amen. Uh, I guess uh, understanding the needs of the community, mm. it's, it's, it's key to really develop a, uh, a vision and a mission. How are you going to use that? Well, I think I need to do this with, you know, I mean, what church uh, analyzed our community yeah. and, and, and see what we can do for them. Good, good. Even though the cross-cultural environment may be a lot different, there's so much need for me to become much more organized and deliberate in the steps that typically work while still really depending on the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Understand your community. Yeah. How are you going to use that? Uh, this is more people in community. Nice. I practice the 10 steps. Yeah. How are you going to practice them? Okay, right. Follow the duration and then uh, keep doing. Yeah, good, good. Stay consistent. All right. Well, I will, uh, I will review this, all these principles to the church board, uh -huh. and I will celebrate with my church what they're doing now. Okay. Yeah. You can speak in Spanish. No, necesitamos plantar más iglesias. We need to plant more churches. All right. Okay. <laughs> Um, we need a well sought out plan vision. Yeah. So I need to pray on a vision. Okay, good. A God sized good. vision. Excellent. Even though uh, door to door is something very normal for me as a co porter, I think it's uh, personally, it's, I, need to, I need to reach this next step. Mm -hmm. on uh, being more specific on the things we, we do, you know. Oh, nice. Asking about needs and stuff. Yes. Good, good. Just keep the vision of where you're going in front of the people you're working with so that you're not the only one that has the vision, but that everybody, your whole team, has the vision. Nice. Very important. Very important. Um, <clears throat> I feel like the most important thing I'll take from this is figuring out how to help Pastor Jacob um, figure out how to implement enforcing small groups and ministry as a requirement for mm. the church mm. to start the culture. Amen. Um, for me, it's big expectations and big dreams mm -hmm. and uh, setting numerical goals that are faith, God-sized. Okay. You know, just pastor. Uh, we our greeting needs help, and so I'll be developing that a lot better with, with what I've learned. Amen. I like the training everybody how to lead all things, mm -hmm. continually um, involving cross-training so that they can go plan or cover when needed. Good, good. I'd like to uh, help uh, Salt of Life, where I'm from, to keep track of people mm -hmm. better, make sure that every single person that enters uh, is not let go very easily. Yeah. Amen. Good, good. Amen. I have a strategy. Yeah, excellent. The, the idea of the process. Yeah. It's simple, clear, and the intentionality and the purpose of that and the timeline. I love the timeline because it's, I think that it will help. And so you're going to develop that type of stuff? I will try to do that Amen. as best as possible. Amen. This, this, they are going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He will tell them to do it. Yeah, it was just a nice reminder that uh, discipling through relationships for free, as Jesus did, still works. Yeah. Um, I'm doing it in several areas. One area I'm doing now uh, and doing even more this weekend is through greeters mm -hmm. at our Amen. church. So. Amen. The idea that we have um, both the message and the method mm. and that we have focused a lot on the message. We have an amazing message. Now we need to adopt the method. And so I want to go back and uh, train my church mm. and uh, future churches Amen. on the method. Amen. Instill in the group that this is a movement, not necessarily planting a church just to stay stagnant yeah. and continue to move. Amen. So. Amen. Uh, sí, plantar iglesias. To plant uh, churches. 
eh, se necesita de todas maneras de un proceso. You, you, need a process to plant churches. Y cuando saltamos los procesos, and then when we jump through the process, el, no aseguramos un buen resultado a, a, a good result al plantar una nueva iglesia. Uh, as we plant another church. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, for me, it's, this helped me to open my mind in, in all the concept of the leadership in my church. Mm -hmm. And we need more intentional and, yeah. and, and, leaders, our, and, and, and the leadership in, in our churches, especially for make disciples mm -hmm. and motivate the church to plant more churches. Amen. Sometimes we think about this will be amazing if we are uh, Andrews University, uh, Southwestern. We have a curriculum teaching this. But the reality is that we are not there yet. Then we need to start changing with us, with our people, with our pastors, and with every plan that we do from now on. Amen. We need to see, to feel the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit mm. in our life, in our group, in our church. Yeah. Amen. Good. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to do this. Um, I also wanted to, um, if we could, just have a time of prayer together and just pray that a movement will start within each of us. Because I believe strongly that in this room that every one of us can be a movement. And we just have to make the decision. Are we going to let God use us in that way? Because that's how God trains his disciples, is to make movements. Um, if you read, read the New Testament, you'll see that each of them had their own unique way of doing that. But God used them to spread his work around the world rapidly. And I want to go home. Amen. I want to go to heaven. And we really need this movement to accelerate and once once the uh, Texas conference and maybe my conference and others start actually creating movements then other places around the world will take notice um, you know there's a Texas conference was known as the church planting center and still you plant a lot of churches but if you become movement makers man that's going to make change the world so let's let's be those people. So can we all gather just up around here and let's let's have uh, uh, Dan, if you would pray over this group, and then Robin, would you pray over this group as well? Press together, press together, press together. That's right. Drug us. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, we got to get everybody in the line. Get in the line. Don't leave them. But out. however works best for you. Eternal Father in heaven, you are the God who wants to invite all uh, your children home soon. Amen. And Lord, we want this message, uh, just as prophesied, to go to every nation and tribe and language and people group. We know it will happen with or without us. But Lord, for too long we've um, been dilly-dallying here on earth and been somewhat satisfied at times. So Lord, I just pray that in each of our hearts we'll... Um, be born or rekindled or strengthened that desire to see new people gathered to in gatherings and for your kingdom who will in turn invite others who will invite others who invite others 
Lord, help us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Help us to um, know where, what we can do where we're at and uh, what we can do to start new work in new places. And uh, Lord, as we do this, we know that we're going to stub our toes and skin our knees, but we're going to learn to trust you in new areas <laughs> of our life. Amen. Watch over our families, too, so that we might move together as families in these processes. Bless Steve and his team and their ministry. Thank you for his sharing these insights. And Lord, we just ask that um, it'll be good seed and good soil here in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Father in heaven, thank you for everything you have given us, and especially, Lord, for this time we have shared together with Steve, with um evangelism uh, coordinators and church plan coordinators and Lord especially because we have felt the presence of the Holy Spirit Amen. among us and Lord if we go back in history in the history of our church there was a little amount of people that started moving and we would like to be compared to a little amount of leaders pastors that we want to start a movement in Texas. Mm -hmm. What about if you have called us for a time such as this? Mm -hmm. To make a difference, to really plant a seed that will grow and will expand in Texas. And we start planting new churches, new congregation with a mission minded, mm -hmm. the mission of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. the method of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we start treating each other with love and compassion because that's what you really projected since mm -hmm. the beginning. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. God all right. bless you all. One, thank you. One, two, three. Grow. When you have the Lord and you have each other, what else do you need? <laughs> guys, uh, guys, guys. Guys and gals, there's no money. There's no money to uh, Elmer and we got you, please. One second. There's no money to pay for the knowledge of many, many years. For the mistakes of many, many years. Yeah. <laughs> many years. And for the wisdom that he's willing to share with us and not keep it for him or get credited because he wrote a book and now he's selling a book. No. He says, I will just give you everything to guys, to you guys in Texas. I don't have a book. I don't have, I'm not selling anything. So there is a little token right here from evangelism and church planting department. Uh, oh, thank you very much. For Steve. Appreciate it. Um, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. He will be here again last Weekend in February 2021. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know that one, but we're gonna commit. Make a commit. We'll see. Like all of our pastors. <laughs> yes. God bless you all. Thank you. All right.